no, no, how close has the 2004 that. advisory okay. opinion gotten the the he's 100 percent so cooked this is the fundamental flaw in arguing from a liberal position that is completely empty completely devoid of morality the only people that will consider you to be a, a, a brilliant intellectual person are people who are too stupid one day i hope that we will look back at this and shudder and we will have a hard time comprehending the inhumanity of the statements that this is making let's get back to mr bonarelli so at this point the debate is taking a pause i do want to i do want to talk about like um the amount of coverage the amount of back and forth that occurred so far on october 7 versus the amount of time that was spent on gaza before a break took place important for people to to you know remember that like the death toll when they're talking about october 8th and onwards is infinitely higher than the much discussed much discussed october 7 here there's a little bit of an imbalance there um it's partially because of uh i think norm's uh, uh stubbornness i think for sure but just important yeah here are this was one of the top comments underneath the video which i think is really funny just showing all of the timestamps where uh norm <laughs> brings up very different uh names for mr bonarelli by your solicitude for international law you should try learning it sometime it would help you sort out a lot of the civilian deaths i was disappointed in norm for this one i am not disappointed in norm at all it would take a lot I, I have been disappointed in Norm in the past, uh, especially as it comes as it pertains to like contemporary domestic American politics and like Id Paul or whatever. But it was it, when it comes to when it comes to Gaza, he is the authority. Okay. Fortunately, fifteen judges disagree. You could keep citing the judges. You should actually try reading the actual statements. This is tiring. Uh, you You've doing? invited us to a tiring session. I found it interesting how Desi's community didn't share any clips of him reacting to this or even reacting to your react. I wonder why. Yeah, because they love burying they love burying when uh when when top dog gets actually f uh, abused okay and and humiliated to act like it doesn't exist they try to wipe it out so they will immediately move on to the next thing which was me reacting to it to be like oh he's such a piece of shit let's try to get him banned for reacting to this uh you know to for reacting to this debate but uh you know I think a lot of people are watching it and also uh, arriving at the same conclusion that we have in this community that that he also recognizes that he got humpstered and dumpstered because of course he was going to what it is not for norm to dismiss completely incorrect statements from a man who actively has read through wikipedia pages to keep up with the situation he needed to shut up and actually let qualified people talk yeah Fanny thinks he understands international law better than the 15 judges in the international court of justice is absolutely incredible imagine being that arrogant without any qualifications at all but reading a wikipedia page yes and uh they'll move on to character assassination of norm as well i think uh most likely because this is the this is the way that you operate you're like i don't talk about the debate talk about my interlocutors and how they're wrong if you can't f clip them out of context and like consistently pump that narrative then move on to other shit like you know dox them or find things from their past and like talk about how f uh ridiculous they are and and i'm sure they're doing that already uh desperately desperately trying to pump and dump uh and, and investing themselves into changing the narrative desperately away from the fact that their top dog got absolutely owned. So he'll just keep flailing until people forget about it. There's a, there are major things to discuss here, not just what, what some court is doing and gonna okay. judge in two years time. Yes, okay. So what you just said is my whole, one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about this particular conflict is because there are really important things to discuss, but they will right. never be discussed. They're not doing We're not gonna talk about them. like, uh, like uh, area A, B, and C, or what a transference of territory, instead we're gonna talk about apartheid. We're not gonna talk about, um, you know, the differences in how do you conduct war in an urban environment where people use, we're yeah. just gonna talk about genocide. We're not gonna talk about no, 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 um, right. what's a good solution we're for the Palestinians. We're just gonna say ethnic cleansing. Possible to talk, uh, be productive over the next two hours and talk about solutions. About solutions. I have no idea what to say. I mean, there, there, I don't see any solutions on, you know, if you wanted a positive end to this discussion, mm -hmm. which is what you said at the beginning, I can't contribute to that because I, I'm pessimistic. I don't see anywhere, any way forward here. But the lack of, the solution is, is easy. The reason why the solution is hard is because the histories and the myths are completely, there's a different factual record, well, right? Well, well, one of the things would be- Yeah, it, no, he is right. He's right on this. Mr. Bonercello, 
is right. There is the real, accurate, historical record who my contemporaries such as Benny Morris will also reckon with. And then there's Israel's lack of historical record. The reason why there is such a deviation, a diversity of ideas is because of the Zionist interest in not parsing through the historical facts. It is a deliberate attempt at whitewashing Israel's history. On page 514 in my 18th book on Gaza, I've detailed, I've dedicated 38 pages exclusively of footnotes detailing the many instances where the Israeli government has lied. <laughs> Mr. Boy RD, you will not find this on Wikipedia. <laughs> so perhaps that is the reason you are unfamiliar. <laughs> Good to talk about solutions with the future is going back in all the times it has failed. So every time but even at that, we're probably not going to agree. He's going to say, you could write that. I can predict the whole line. He's going to say from 93 to 99, he's going to say Israel didn't adhere to the Oslo Accords ever. Settlement expansion continued. Uh, raids happened into the uh, West Bank that there was never a legitimate that Netanyahu came in and violated the. I like that he's like predicting what Norm Figgelstein is going to say, because like, yeah, you're you're predicting that because that is what happened. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm predicting that Norm is going to give an accurate retelling of all the events that actually transpired in this time frame. Yeah, okay, exactly. Your your prediction is accurate because that is exactly what happened. It, it, like, if you don't have a counter argument to it, all you can do is, I'm predicting this is what he's going to say. Okay, yeah, it is predictable because if one party is making an, uh, an assessment or rather uh, repeating events that transpired and the other party has no counter to it, all you can do is just basically say, well, I'm predicting this is what he's going to say. Okay, how about you predict the counter to some of that the uh, um the why uh, memorandum the transference the he's going to say sure, all sure, of this sure. and he's not going to bring up anything the Palestinian side and then for camp david he's going to say that uh yeah that arafat was trying that the maps and the territorial exchange wasn't good enough that they were asking palestinians to make all the concessions that israel would have made like it's yeah well, oh, well lay it all up lay it up you do talk quickly you know? yeah i know yeah <laughs> <laughs> and yeah my future book should interest you guys oh what it are you working with, on it no it's not working on it's actually going to come out. Ah. Um, it deals with Israeli and Arab atrocities, war crimes, I call them, in the 48 war. That's oh, really? Book, yeah. yeah. Just deals with that subject. Is this, because um, I know... <laughs> bro, bro really is about to write another book about, like, Deir Yassin, only to be like, and it was actually justified. <laughs> he's going to do a, he's going to do an accurate, he's going to do an accurate retelling of the horrifying war crimes committed by Israeli terror cells and then and, and slap on a conclusion at the end of it like well it was it was good it was for a you know for a higher cause you've also uh talked about the closure of the archives and stuff well it's it's marginal yeah. they do it deals with that as well but yeah. they have tried to seal off documents which had already used and yeah. seen so now yeah. they don't let people yeah. see them uh, that's happened but it's it, it's marginal in terms of its effect yeah. on 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 were the british archives useful for you for this yeah. new book well for this list it's mostly israeli archives yeah, yeah. the british and the americans and the un did deal with these subjects but not not as well as israeli documents what's your uh, casualty count for Deir Yassin? It's about 100. I about think there's 100. agreement on that by Israelis and Arabs. Yeah. 100, 105. Because yeah. before they were... They used to say 245 yeah. or 254. Yeah. Those were the figures the British and the Arabs and the Haganah agreed on at the, at the beginning. Because the Red Cross, I think, was the one that first put out that number. I don't remember. Maybe it yeah. was, what's his name, Jacques de yeah, Rainier. Or maybe. Yeah. yeah, maybe he, he yeah. came up with that number. But it was just, he didn't count. They didn't count bodies. Uh. They just threw the number out and uh. everybody was happy to yeah. blame the Irgun and the Lehi yeah. for, you know, killing more Arabs than actually. Well, and they, and they put it to good use as well. Uh. Well, they the said Lehi. that it helped to precipitate more yeah. evacuation. So they I were happy. I think Begin and his yeah, uh, yeah, memoirs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They also used that this. number. Yeah, yeah. Sure. By the way, this is, uh, again, um, 
Oh, we. I was watching the. Uh, I was watching the 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 conversation that took place between you know three very knowledgeable people and also a a uh, kick streamer. Oof. Mike Maylag, everybody, also known as Hey Big Mike. How's everybody doing today? All Thanks right. for having me on. All right, let's get. So back first of to all, Mr. thank Balotelli. you for that heated discussion about the present. I would love to go back into history in a way that informs what we can look for in a, uh, as a, by way of hope for the future. So when has, in Israel and Palestine, have we been closest to something like a peace settlement? To something that, like where both sides would be happy and enable the flourishing of both peoples? Well, my, my, from my knowledge of the 120 years or so of conflict, the closest I think the two sides have been to reaching some sort of settlement appears to have been in the year 2000 when Barack and then subsequently Clinton uh, offered a two-state um, settlement uh, to PLO Palestinian Authority Chairman Yasser Arafat. And Arafat uh, seemed to waver. He didn't immediately... This is going to be good because this is like, finally, we're talking about actual facts and not just like a shit-slinging competition, I hope. Um, uh, ...reject what was being offered. But ultimately, he came down at the end of Camp David in July 2000. He came down against the proposals and the Clinton, who said he wouldn't blame him, later blamed Arafat for uh, bringing down the summit and um, not reaching a solution there. Um, but I, I think there, on the table... Uh, certainly in the Clinton parameters of December 2000, which followed uh, uh, the proposals by Barack uh, in July, um, the Palestinians were offered the best deal they're ever going to get from Israel, unless Israel is destroyed and then there'll just be a Palestinian Arab state. But um, the best deal that Israel could ever offer them, they were offered, uh, which essentially was 95% of the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, uh, half of the old city of Jerusalem, some sort of joint control of the Temple Mount uh, and the Gaza Strip, of course, in full. And the Palestinians said no to this deal. And nobody really knows why Arafat said no. That is, some people think he was trying to hold out for... <laughs> nobody knows why he said no? Bro. <laughs> no, people definitely know why he said no. He very openly said it, too. It's not even... He didn't even say no. That's the other thing. Um, he, he did openly state that a major point of contention would be that he would get assassinated. Or slightly better terms. And he had no um, capacity to say no. But my, I mean, my uh, reading yes. is that he was constitutionally, psychologically incapable of signing off on a two-state deal, meaning acceptance of the existence of a Jewish state. This was really the problem. And, uh, of Israel or of a Jewish state? Of a Jewish state, the Jewish state of Israel. He, he wasn't willing to share Palestine with the Jews and put his name to that. Um, I, I think he just wouldn't do it. Uh, that, that's my reading. But some people say it was because the terms were insufficient and he was willing, but was waiting for slightly better terms. I, I, don't, I don't buy that. I don't think so. But other people disagree with me on this. He doesn't buy that. Uh, no water rights, no states' rights, no standing military... Uh, and also Jerusalem is given unconditionally to the state of Israel, a thing that he had no right to say yes to, by the way, which was like part of which was part of the uh, contention that it was not within his grounds to say yes to the permanent annexation of Jerusalem, um, because he said this is a historically and religiously significant land that is far beyond my or your uh, uh, powers of of. Uh, recognizing uh, belongs to as belonging to one side. He very famously said that uh, you know because uh, I think uh, Bill Clinton tried to sweeten the deal by uh, it, Clinton offered him like a nice house overlooking uh, I think Al Aqsa or something. Then he was like, "It's great, like uh, you're, you're offering me a nice house that I will be assassinated in. Like you're out of your mind. They will kill me." What What do you think? Well, just briefly, in response, um, Arafat formally recognized Israel in, in 1993. Yeah, totally. um, I, don't, I don't think actually that in 2000, 2001, uh, a genuine um, resolution was on offer because I think the maximum Israel was prepared to offer, admittedly more than it had been prepared to offer in the past, fell short of the minimum that the Palestinians considered to be a reasonable two-state settlement, bearing in mind um, that as of 1949, uh, Israel controlled 78% of the British Mandate of Palestine. Um, the Palestinians were seeking a state on the remaining 22%, and this was apparently too much for Israel. My, my response to your question would be... Wait, wait, they were being offered something like 22 or 21%. They, they were being offered, I think, um, less than a withdrawal to the 1967 borders with mutual and minor and reciprocal land swaps and the just resolution of... Uh, the refugee, uh, refugee problem was problem one of the questions. Question. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I worked yeah. for... No the refugee problem is part of the question is a great way to frame it. And let me tell you, okay, the refugee problem is only a f problem if you have an interest in maintaining a demographic majority Jewish ethno state. You're framing it in the most insane way possible.
number of years um, with um, uh, International Crisis Group, and my boss at the time was Rob Malley, who was one of the American officials who, present who at Camp David. thrown out of the State well, Department, whatever. The point, I'm, the point I want to make about um, uh, Rob was he wrote, I think, a very perceptive article in 2001 yeah, in the Rabani New York Review Books. I know that you and Ehud Barak have had it. Yeah, a... uh, Rabani does a phenomenal job throughout this entire process. I feel bad that I'm like covering his face a little bit here because for obvious reasons. Uh, for those of you who don't know, if you weren't here yesterday, I'm covering it because like, um, while there are three individuals who are relatively knowledgeable, even though they have obviously ideological disagreements, and maybe sometimes Benny Morris can be like a, a historical from time to time, there's a third person, uh, there's a fourth person involved in this, an iPad kid, if you will, that is banned from this platform for very good reasons. And therefore, I am trying to do my very best to make sure that I am not like engaging in ban evasion, a term of service violation, considering that he's not the focal point of this conversation in any meaningful capacity. And this is more so a, a five hour debate on uh, a, a ongoing geopolitical conflict that is very important to uh, my commentary and everything I talk about. I think it's like valid to watch it, but I'm also doing my very best to ensure that, you know, I'm trying to, uh, you know, not engage in ban evasion. To debate with them, but I think he gives a very compelling reason of why and how um, uh, Camp, uh, Camp David failed. But rather than going into that, I'll-, I'll He wrote that together with uh, Hussein Ara. Uh, Hussein yeah, Ara, yes, yeah. who was not at Camp David. Yes. Um, but in response to your question, um, I think there could have been a real possibility of Israeli-Palestinian and Arab-Israeli peace in the mid-1970s, in the wake of the 1973 I love hearing from a guy who just doesn't know anything about Twitch streaming uh, against a guy who's been Twitch streaming professionally for six years. Thank you, Sussy Chris. Um, everything you just said is, is the exact opposite. For the record, it's stupid. The rules are stupid. But everything you said is the exact opposite in terms of ban uh, evasion. That would be direct ban evasion under Twitch Terms of Service. Also, thank you for recognizing. All right. October War. Um, uh, I'll, I'll recall that in 1971, Moshe Dayan, Israel's uh, defense minister at the time, uh, full of triumphalism about Israel's uh, victory in 1967, speaking to a group of Israeli military veterans, stated, you know, if I had to choose between um, uh, Sharm el-Sheikh without peace or peace without Sharm el-Sheikh, this is referring to the um, resort in, in, in Egyptian Sinai, which was then under Israeli occupation, Dayan said, I will choose for Sharm el-Sheikh without peace. Um, then the 1973 war came along, and um, uh, I think Israeli calculations began to change very significantly. And I think it was in that context that had there been a joint U.S.-Soviet um, push for um, uh, an Arab-Israeli and Israeli-Palestinian resolution that incorporated both an Israeli withdrawal to the 1967 lines and the establishment of a Palestinian state um, in, in the occupied territories, I think it, there was a very reasonable prospect for that being achieved. It ended up being aborted, I think, um, uh, for several reasons. And ultimately, um, the Egyptian uh, president, Anwar Sadat, um, decided, uh, for reasons we can discuss later, to launch a separate unilateral initiative for um, Israeli-Egyptian rather than Arab-Israeli peace. And I think once that set in motion, um, the prospects uh, disappeared because Israel essentially saw its most powerful adversary removed from the equation and felt that this would give it a free hand in the occupied territories, also in Lebanon to get rid of the PLO and so on. So, um, you know, and you ask when were we closest? And I can't give you an answer of when we were closest. I can only tell you when I think we, we could have been uh, close, and that was a that was a lost opportunity. Um, if we look at the situation today, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about a two state settlement. My own view, and I've I've written about this. Uh, I don't I don't buy the arguments of the naysayers that we have passed uh, the so called point of no return with respect to a two state settlement. Certainly, if you look at the Israeli position in the occupied territories. I would argue it's more tenuous than was the French position in Algeria in 1954, than was a British position in Ireland in 1916, than was the Ethiopian position in uh, Eritrea in 1990. And so as a matter of practicality, as a matter of principle, I do think um, the establishment of a Palestinian state uh, in, in the occupied territories remains realistic. I think the question that we now need to ask ourselves, it's one I'm certainly asking myself, um, since October 7th and looking at Israel's genocidal campaign, but also looking at larger questions, is it desirable? Can you have peace with what increasingly appears to be an irrational genocidal state that seeks to confront yep. and resolve each and every political challenge with violence and that reacts to its failure to achieve 
solutions to political um, challenges with violence by applying even more violence that has an insatiable lust for Palestinian territory, um, that, you know, a, a genocidal apartheid state that seems increasingly incapable of even conceiving of peaceful coexistence um, uh, with, with the other people on that land. Um, so I'm very pessimistic that a, a solution is possible. I look at, um, I grew up um, in Western Europe in the long shadow of the Second World War. Um, I think we can all agree that there could have been no peace in Europe um, had certain regimes on that continent not been removed from power. Um, I look at um, uh, Southeast Asia in the late 1970s, and I think we're all agreed that there could not have been peace in that region had the Khmer Rouge uh, not been ousted. I look at Southern Africa during the 1990s, and I think we can all be agreed that had the white minority regimes of um, that ruled Zimbabwe and South Africa not been dismantled, there could not have been peace in that region. And although I think it's worth having a discussion, um, I do think it's now a legitimate question to ask, can there be peace um, without dismantling uh, the Zionist uh, regime? And I make a very clear distinction between the Israeli state and its institutions on the one hand, um, and the Israeli people, who I think, regardless of our discussion uh, about the history, I think you can now talk about an Israeli people and a people um, that have developed uh, rights over time and um, a formula for peaceful coexistence with them uh, will need to be found, which is a separate matter from uh, dismantling um, the Israeli state and its institutions. And again, I haven't reached clear conclusions about this, except to say, as a practical matter, I think a two-state uh, settlement remains uh, uh, feasible. But I think there are very legitimate questions about its desirability um, and about whether peace can be achieved in the Middle East um, with the persistence of an irrational, genocidal, apartheid uh, regime, particularly because Israeli society- Rabani is so- good dude he is like he is he's so brilliant he is so brilliant yeah it is a very well formulated and well informed answer like incredible I, I don't know i don't know what else to say other than no notes incredible he is um uh beginning to watch. develop i'll say this much i get exactly why i get exactly why norm wanted him uh to be a part of this he is like almost a perfect counterweight to norm in many respects like obviously they're both correct but their styles are very different um and and he is he's brilliant um many extremely extremely uh distasteful supremacist uh dehumanizing uh, aspects that i think also stand in the way of uh coexistence that are being fed by this uh regime so if you look back into history when we're closest to peace and do you draw any hope from any of them um i feel like in 2000 i feel like the deal that was present uh at least at the end of the top of summit i think in terms of what Israel, I think, had the appetite to give and what the Palestinians would have gotten would have definitely been the most agreeable between the two parties. Um, I don't know if in 73, I'm not sure if the appetite would have ever been there for the Arab states to negotiate alongside the Palestinians. I know that um, in Jordan, there was no love for the Palestinians after you know 1970, after Black September. Um, I know that Sadat had no love for the Palestinians um, due to their associ with, association with the Muslim Brotherhood, attempted assassinations in Egypt. Um, Sorry, which? PLO and the Muslim Brotherhood? Sadat was upset because there were attempted assassinations by people in, oh no, an assassination. Um, it was a personal friend of his, Yusuf al sibai I can't pronounce that. He was assassinated yeah, in Cyprus, Cyprus by a Palestinian killed by the Abu Nidal organization. Sure, yeah. Uh, admittedly, yeah, he says as much, belongs to a group, not the PLO directly, but I think that um, there was a history of um, the Palestinians sometimes uh, fighting with their neighboring states. They were hosting if they weren't getting the political concessions they wanted. Um, the assassination of the Jordanian king of 50. That's crazy. One might be another example of that in Jordan. Um, it, it feels like over a long period of time, it feels like the Palestinians have been kind of told from the neighboring Arab states that if they just continue to enact violence, whether in Israel or abroad, that eventually a state will materialize somehow. Uh, I don't think it's gotten them any closer to a state. If anything, I think it's taken them farther and farther and farther away from one. And I think as long as the hyperbolic language is continually employed internationally, the idea that Israel is committing a genocide, the idea that there is an apartheid, the idea... Oh, oh, I didn't realize it was actually not like Israel's genocidal actions that are moving every that's moving everyone away from peace. It's actually the hyperbolic language being applied. Damn. Dude, dude, excuse me. I didn't realize, yeah. I didn't realize the Palestinians and everyone else, I mean, their lives and, and their worldview and their deaths. It's actually other people correctly saying, it's the Human Rights Watch that in 2021 said Israel is an apartheid state. That is actually the reason why we will never achieve peace now. It wasn't like actually having an apartheid state. It was people saying this apartheid state is an apartheid state. Damn, dude. Omni liberalism on top, baby. In 2022, sorry, Amnesty International, not 2021.
America, that they live in a concentration camp. All of these words, I think, further the narrative for the Palestinians that Israel is an evil state that needs to be dismantled. Um, I mean, you said as much about the institution, at least, of the Zionist government. Uh, Israel's government is probably not going anywhere. All of the other surrounding Arab states have accepted that, or at least most of them down in the Gulf, Egypt and Jordan, have accepted that. Uh, the Palestinians need to accept it too. The, the Israeli state, or the state apparatus, is not going anywhere. And at some point, they need to realize, like, hey, we need a leader that's going to come out and represent us, represent all of us, is willing to take political risks, is willing to negotiate some lasting peace for us. And it's not going to be the international community or some invocation of international law or some invocation of morality or justice that's going to extricate us from this conflict. It's going to take some actual difficult political maneuvering on the ground. Of for, accepting Israel. Of accepting Israel, which yeah. Which they formally did in 1993. <clears throat> which they formally did in 1993. Yeah, but then no no lasting peace came after that in I think they first recognized it in 1973 and formally accepted it in 1993. Oh, whose fault is that, I reckon? Perhaps there was some other shit that happened in 1993. It, it's so crazy that one historical reference, like one historical fact that he did not cherry pick from his Wikipedia argument, immediately just destroys, just destroys everything that he just, the foundational basis of what he was presenting. No, because uh, 1993 was not a peace agreement. Sure, the Oslo Accords were, was, were an didn't interim have a final solution. Were an interim, yeah. were an interim agreement, and um, Palestinians actually began clamoring for commencing the the permanent status uh, resolutions on schedule, and the Israelis kept delaying them. In fact, they only began, I believe, in '99 under American pressure on, on the Israelis. And I think you're being a bit one-sided. Both sides didn't fulfill the promise of Oslo and the steps needed for Oslo. There was Palestinian terrorism, which accompanied Israel's expansion of settlements and other things. The two things fed each other and uh, led to what happened in 2000, which was a breakdown of the talks. Did you just say they're Jewish, you guys? They can use the term final solution? The guy who used the term final solution is not Jewish. Destiny's not Jewish, bro. What? And also, what do you mean? You, you, you gotta be joking, right? To be fair, I was being charitable, and, and I assumed that he wasn't, like, cynically using that term to invoke... Holocaust memes in an otherwise serious conversation and Rabani isn't Jewish either. Um, I think that he just said it as like no permanent solution instead of and then accidentally said final totally ignorable uh, Like I, I ignored it because it's irrelevant. Sinian said no, but I, I think there's a I, I don't I don't agree incidentally with this definition of Israel or the Israeli state as a apartheid, it's not. There is a, some sort of apartheid going on in the West Bank. The Israeli regime itself is not an apartheid regime. That is nonsense. By any definition of apartheid, which... Well, by, by the formal definition, I think it qualifies. No, it doesn't qualify. Uh, apartheid is a, a race-based race uh, distinction between different segments of the population. Um, and some of them don't have any representation at all like the blacks in South Africa, no, a, no rights at all. In, in Israel, in Israel itself, the, uh, the minority, the Arabs, do have representation, do have rights, and so on. I don't think Israel is also genocidal. I don't think it's been genocidal. It wasn't so in 48, it wasn't so in 67, and it hasn't been recently, in my view. Um, and talk about dismantling Israel, and that's what you're talking about, um, is, I think Stephen said it correctly, is, counterproductive. It just pushes Israelis further away from willing to give Palestinians anything. I love, I love Zionists, no matter how light in their support, no matter how heavy handed in their support, it always, the conversation always starts with straight up genocide denial. And then the conversation always ends with, well, you're saying that I'm doing genocide denial, which is making it really hard for me to come to terms with your assessment. It's like, dude, considering that you wrote the book on the ethnic displacement of Palestinians and then literally arrived at the conclusion that it's like good, actually, it's for a higher cause, it's a objectively good thing that this happened, it had to happen, it was inevitable. Like, it's ridiculous to f let that hang there and then continue to have a conversation with you as though you're actually making an honest moral assessment here that is morally righteous. It's not. Defending fascism from a liberal framework is, is always going to run into this ideological uh, uh, crossroad. Who followed this racist on my account?
That's so funny. Please don't ban this guy. I love this guy. This is exactly the type of shit I'm on. He called me a racist. Watching Destiny live search Wikipedia is a surreal experience. Yeah, I saw that. Listen, listen, bro. Look, you know, he, he's got to bring something to the table. Okay, quick fingers. Please, Norm, tell me you have something optimistic. To say. Optimistic to say. No, I, uh, even though I agree, I've thought about it a lot and I agree with Muin's uh, analysis. Um, I'm not really in the business of punditry. I rather look at the historical record where I feel more comfortable and I feel on terra firma. So I'd like to just go through that. Uh, I don't quite, I agree and I disagree with Muin on the 73 issue. After the 1973 war, uh, it was clear that Israel was surprised by what happened during the war. And um, uh, it took a big hit. The estimates are, I don't know what numbers you use, but I hear between two and 3,000 Israeli uh, soldiers were killed uh, during the 1970s. It was 2,500? Yeah, 2,700. Yeah. Okay, so I got it right. Yeah. I read different numbers. That's, you know, it's a very large number uh, of Israelis who were killed. Uh, there were moments at the beginning of the war where there was a fear that this might be it. Uh, no, no, fact, there wasn't, fact, there wasn't, there wasn't. No, the this Israelis... You, everybody it, forgets Israel's atomic weaponry. I know, but... So how could oh, they have been defeated? Diane, Didn't Diane, Diane talk about the collapse of the third attempt. temple? He did, yeah. but, that, but it was hysterical and oh, well, silly. But that, I because Israel I don't had atomic weapons. Just, okay. They wanted to stop I don't know the Syrians was, or the Egyptians. But we're talking about perceptions yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I can't tell you if he was hysterical or not. No, he was. was for a day he was in the hysterical. same room with him. For a day he was hysterical. But I'm just saying, let's not bog down on this. Wait, I thought the family atomics was not real. What happened? What happened? The atomics exist? Or does the family atomics not exist in Israel? Interesting. Like the top of the hour ad break in the minds and souls and hearts of those who are subscribed they don't see it so they don't think it's real but for everybody else who is unsubscribed well they certainly see it and it's a very real thing for them uh, the war is over and when president carter comes into power carter was an extremely smart guy jimmy carter extremely smart guy and he was very fixed on details extreme he was probably the most impressive of modern american presidents in my opinion, by a wide margin. And he was determined to resolve the conflict uh, on, a, on a big scale, on the Arab-Israeli scale. On the Palestinian scale, uh, uh, issue, he wouldn't go past what he called the Palestinian homeland. He wouldn't Palestinian accept- Palestinian national home. And the Palestinian <laughs> national home. He wouldn't go as far as a Palestinian state. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that. I, I don't think realistically, given the political balance of forces, that was going to happen but that's a separate issue. Let's get to the issue at hand, namely what is the obstacle or what has been the obstacle since the early 1970s. Since roughly 1974, the Palestinians have accepted the two-state settlement on the June 1967 border. Now, as it got, as more pressure was exerted on Israel because the Palestinians seemed reasonable, the Israelis, to quote the Israeli political scientist Avner Yaniv, he since passed from the scene, he said, uh, Yaniv in his book, Dilemmas of Security, he said that the big, Palestin big Israeli fear was what he called the Palestinian peace offensive. That was their worry, that the Palestinians were becoming too moderate. And unless you understand that, yep. you can't understand the June 1982 Lebanon war. The purpose of the June 1982 Lebanon war was to liquidate the PLO in southern Lebanon because they were too moderate, the Palestinian peace offensive. I'm going to have to fast forward. There are many events. There's the first intifada, then there's the Oslo Accord, and let's now go to uh, the, the, the heart of the issue, namely the 2000-2001 uh, the negotiations. Well. Um, the negotiations are divided into three parts for the sake of listeners. What he just said is really important for people to understand. With respect to Israel's fears of the Palestinian liberation organizations becoming much more um, palatable to the Western world. This was always a very real fear because... Deep down inside, everybody kind of recognizes that the Palestinians do have a right to that land. It's like if the indigenous populations weren't full-blown, cast aside, 
genocided and could literally communicate with the rest of the world that like holy shit these guys are killing us and we just want we just want the killing to end we want the oppression to end it's important to recognize this because the destruction of the peace process from the israeli side which netanyahu literally openly championed and ran on by the way played the role of making or legitimizing the reactionary more fundamentalist more reactionary forces within palestinian society that were developing prominence like hamas the only mechanism of pushback against the Israeli state that consistently utilized the two-state solution and the peace process, the so-called peace process, as a way to quietly and sometimes very publicly and openly continue permanently annexing land, continue uh, creating Bantustan's ghettos in the occupied West Bank through settler expansion. That is a very that, that's why Israel's way more comfortable with Hamas being the only entity that defends the interests of the Palestinians. Benjamin Netanyahu has openly admitted this as well. He has openly stated this both in closed door meetings, openly to members of the Knesset, saying that we can always control Hamas in the way that we know how to. We control how high the flames go in referencing Gaza. Israel never wanted a real partner in peace. This is why it is fraudulent when people suggest this false narrative. It is obviously a historical. It is obviously, it is obviously not only a historical, but it's also, I think, impossible to contend with. If you know anything about the situation, if you want to prevent the creation of a Palestinian state, we must support Hamas, and that includes financially. This is our strategy. Benjamin Netanyahu said it, I believe, 2017. There's Camp David in July 2000. There are the Clinton parameters in December 2000, and then there are negotiations in Taba, uh, in Egypt, Taba in Egypt, in 2001. Those are the three phases. Now, I have studied the record probably- How do you speak even slower? I love, and Mr. Bonarelli's fans come in to this community. I love when Mr. Bonarelli's fans come in here. Wait, what? His family literally owns slaves on Megalol? This guy also seemingly hates Mr. Bonarelli. Mr. Ravioli. Tales you have to master. I'll, I'll vouch for that. I'll the insanity yeah, book, yeah. I, I Actually, I will vouch for it. <laughs> I will personally vouch for it. Um, there is one extensive record from that whole period from 2000 to, you could say, 2007. And that is what came to be called the Palestine Papers, which are about 15,000 pages of all the records of the negotiations. I have read through all of them, every single page. And this is what I find. If you look at Shlomo Ben Ami's book, which I have with me, Prophets Without Honor, it's his last book. He says, going into Camp David, that means July, going into Camp David, July 2000, he said the Israelis were willing to return about, not return, but will withdraw from 90, relinquish. 92% uh, of the West Bank. Ben Ami was at Camp David. Yeah, ben, uh, he was at Taba. I, oh yeah, he was also at Camp David. Uh, they wanted, Israel wanted to keep all the major settlement blocks. It wanted to keep roughly 8% of the West Bank. They were allowing for, you put it at 84 to 90% uh, in your books. Uh, they put it at roughly 92%. Uh, Israel was it also depends to give up. how you calculate. Yeah, it also depends answer. what stage of Camp right. David, because there were two weeks. I, yeah, the, the I'll get to that. Proposals changed during so the two So Israel weeks. wants to keep all the major settlement blocks. It means the border area right. of the West Well, Bank. not the border. We have Ariel. We have Male Adumim. We have, yeah, as, Condoleezza Rice, as Condoleezza Rice called Ariel, she said it was a dagger into the heart of the West Bank. So they want to keep 8% of the land. They want to keep the settlement. All the borders. Fun fact, Israel has never suggested that there wouldn't be a permanent military occupation amongst the Jordan boundary. Like there was never a moment where the Palestinians would actually have full control over their own border with Jordan. Like that's a, that's a non-starter. Now tell me how that's a decent proposal. They were like, yeah, you can have your state, no standing military, by the way, but all, and also no border really. And yes, not only do you not have a border, cause like people will use the percentages to make it seem like Israel was actually suggesting like a decent proposal. When it was not the case, because it cut through the West Bank and there were no borders. It was basically a Bantustan. Blocks. They want to keep 80% of the settlers. They will not budge an inch on the question of refugees. To quote uh, Ehud Barak in the article he co-authored with you in the New York Review of Books. Bro, we will accept, and I think the quote's accurate, no moral... It's so funny. Like, they are cooking this dude so goddamn hard on the timeline dude i don't understand how 
I mean, I guess this is a perfect demonstration of like being hoisted on your own petard. The very same confidence deluded destiny for many years into thinking that he was this like brilliant debater devoid of actual like analysis devoid of any of the historical facts or whatever i think and and the fact that he was able to genuinely like bully a lot of people and and humiliate them and uh and you know develop a fan base because he did he does debate a lot of idiots like you know the red pill guys and whatnot and and developing a fan base that's like you are the champion like you are the intellectual champion akin to ben shapiro had caused him to unironically think that he can just do this against people who wrote the books that wikipedia is summarizing the thing that sucks with norman finkelstein is that i don't think we'll ever see a guy that's even somewhat similar to him ever again once he's gone that's it i mean he's definitely right he's so correct about this yeah there are there is no one who is as like there's just no one who is that autistic honestly and also simultaneously yeah that's it like i've never encountered someone people like that usually are in the stem field you know what i mean he has stem lord brain and he has dedicated it entirely to history remember this is a guy who literally refuses to use computers refuses to use phones dude bro he challenged him to an argument but in print exactly that's why he brought books but also he's like very like he, he's a uh, i don't know how to describe it he's like very interesting as a figure like beyond just his dedication to like a a complete retelling a complete and accurate retelling of events yeah no he he is a <laughs> norm finkelstein personally did but larry and jihad on his own i met many of these types in the humanities they tend to be second chair in their faculty in a university slash college norm finkelstein read a book he hates three times just to make sure he has the facts straight so we can shit on the people on this one very specific topic it is some of the most petty shit ever thankfully it's on the right side of history and on behalf of an oppressed people, yeah. What do you mean he doesn't use computers? Bro, that's... You heard what I said. He does not have a cell phone, brother. Norm Finkelstein does not have a cell phone. He has a landline in his house. When my friend, Brace, went to his house to interview him, the landline kept going off. He had to take it out. He called the iPad in front of him that the iPad kid is using a machine. Like, he's looking at it like a prehistoric figure. Like, that is literally, you know what that's like? That's like going to one of these, like, indigenous tribes that has previously not been encountered by man and showing them the iPad. They would have the same approach. They would be like, what is that? If they could communicate. No legal or historical responsibility for what happened to the refugees. So forget about even allowing refugees to return. We accept no moral, legal, or historical responsibility for the refugees. And on Jerusalem, they wanted to keep large parts of Jerusalem. Now, how do we judge who is reasonable and who is not? Then Ami says, I think the Israeli offer was reasonable. That's how he sees it. But what is the standard of reasonable? My standard is, what does international law say? International law says the settlements are illegal. Israel wants to keep all the settlement blocks. 15 judges, all 15, in the Wall decision in 2004, in July 2004, all 15 judges, including the American judge Bergenthal, ruled the settlements are illegal under international law. They want to keep 80% of the settlers. Under international law, all the settlers are illegal in the West Bank. They want to keep large parts of East Jerusalem. But under international law, East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. That's what the international... No, not Palestinian, that's, because there was me. no Palestinian. Okay. Under, There's never been a Palestinian state. How could it be Palestinian? I, I, I listen patiently to you. Told you. Listen, he's the goat. I'm the giraffe. I listen. I, I, I read these people. I listen to these people. That's it. That's a key detail that they will never reckon with. Because Mr. Morelli does not care about the facts of the matter because he did not read the appropriate wikipedia page under international law if you read the decision all territory the not 2004 wall decision all territory beyond the green line which includes east jerusalem is occupied palestinian territory yep. the, Golan Heights. Uh, the designated unit according to the international court of justice the designated unit for palestinian self-determination and they, de they deny any right whatsoever on the right of return the maximum, I don't want to go into the details now, the maximum formal offer was by Ehud Omar in 2008. He offered 
5,000 refugees could return under what was called family reunification, 5,000 in the course of five years, and no recognition of any Israeli responsibility. So if you use as the baseline what the UN General Assembly has said and what the International Court of Justice has said, if you use that baseline, international law, by that baseline, all the concessions came from the Palestinian side. Every single concession came from the Palestinian side. None came from the Israeli side. They may have accepted less than, they, than what they wanted, but it was still beyond what international law allocated to them. Now, you say- Allocated to the Palestinians. Allocated to the Palestinians, yes. Thank you for the clarification. Now, about Arafat, like the Mufti, never liked the guy. I think that was one of the only disagreements uh, Muin and I had when Arafat passed. You were a little sentimental, I was not. Never liked the guy. But <laughs> politics, you don't have to like the guy. There was no question, nobody argues it, that whenever the negotiations started up, the Palestinians just kept saying the same things. No. It, no. They kept saying no. No. Professor Morris, with due respect, incorrect. They kept saying international legitimacy, international law, UN resolutions. They said, we already gave you what, you what the law required. We gave that in 1988, November 1988, and then ratified again at Oslo in 1993. And they said, now we want what was promised us under international law. And that was the one point where everybody on the other side agreed. Clinton, don't talk to me about international law. Livni, during the Omar administration, she said, I studied international law. I don't believe in international law. Every single member on the other side, they didn't want to hear from international law. And to my thinking, that that is the only reasonable baseline for trying to resolve the conflict. And Israel has a longer when, when has international law <laughs> been relevant to any conflict well, basically why, in the world? That, hey, that's why over the last hundred years. That's why the years. Palestinians have to recognize Israel, because that's international law. No, but international that, law was is UN, that was UN it, Resolution 242. Two. by international law or in accordance with international yeah, law. Then, Professor Morris, for argument's sake, let's agree on that. Strictly for argument's sake. What's the alternative? Dennis Ruas said, we're going to decide who gets what on the basis of need. I like that he recognized that. No, he's saying might is right. He's, he's saying might is right. Because if international law doesn't exist, because no one follows it, um, because of selective enforcement, the only time international law ever is like even talked about is when America is using it as a righteous, uh, just cause to go and like invade a country or whatever. And Israel only talks about it when they are using it as a righteous cause to go and blow up Palestinians. Then what is to be done? What remains? Well, what remains is, is obvious. Might is right. Another fundamental principle of Zionism. Needs. So he says, Israel needs this. Israel needs that. Israel needs that. Dennis Ross decided to be the philosopher king. He's going to decide on the basis of need. That's not what he's saying. That's what you are saying for sure. Wait, what? He literally said international law has never been used in any of the past 100 years of conflict, which is not even true. They did literally talk about Bosnia earlier, so suck my dick. And secondly... That is exactly what he said. He said, international law has never been used. Cope? I'm not the one engaging in copium, brother. Your boy got his shit pushed in so hard by like a 900-year-old demon who doesn't even use a cell phone that you have to come in here and literally argue on behalf of your daddy, okay? And argue on behalf of your daddy failing to even present a reasonable argument in defense of a genocidal apartheid regime. Oof. Couldn't read his own book. What? Couldn't read his own book. Talking Eat. about. Dude, 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 dude. This is what happens when like a f mentat who is basically the human version of Wikipedia on this conflict meets a dude who just browses Wikipedia to create post hoc rationalizations for arguments that are devoid of like really important fundamental facts establishing principles like this is what happens you went up against a dude who is the wikipedia this is the wikipedia that he has and you want to know how it was such a f evisceration like such a ruthless takedown it's not even like the twitter people chirping and saying lol it's so funny he called him a mr borelli mr bonarelli whatever that stuff is fun but you know you know he got f his shit pushed in because one he didn't even watch the footage himself didn't want his audience to see it quickly too moved on to try to get me banned for watching it from from uh twitch and last but not least he's been coping the f uh, replies non-stop and one of his funniest copes has been 
Well, he was just quoting stuff too much. You just, that's it. You have conceded. You have been bested in the marketplace of ideas when you're, when your only takedown is basically going, yeah, sorry, uh, I didn't know he had hands like that, intellectually speaking. Like, you just literally did that. You mentally said, well, this is unfair. He has hands. I didn't know he had hands like that. I did not think that he could do that. He cheated by quoting people, some of which were in the room themselves. That's messed up, man. Well, if you ask me, since Gaza is one of the densest places on Earth, it needs a so it it, yes, it, it needs, needs part of Sinai. It needs a nice big chunk of Sinai. Uh, well, not Sinai. That's I, what it actually needs. Okay, I, I don't even want to go there. Uh, <laughs> it needs a nice big chunk. Bro said Sinai. Dude, God, I love, dude, I love the Israeli mind. The, the Zionist Israeli mind has only one, one speed. I swear to God. He, he was so quick. Sinai, he's got to be joking, right? He's not literally like, yeah, 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 Lambridge. Where? Another country. Don't worry, Norm, we got this. We'll just go back and reoccupy it. <laughs> no, he said Sinai, not cyanide. He's saying, don't worry, we'll connect the land bridge between uh, Gaza and the West Bank by retaking parts of Egypt. That is an insane thing to say, but it's also like, yeah, they got the Laban's Brown, Laban's Brown mindset, dude, straight up. <laughs> <laughs> he's like dude i don't understand just we'll make living uh we'll make living space yeah no here we'll push you into the desert don't worry someone else's desert we'll take it and we'll give it to you one speed bro one speed it's not, that's I, what it actually needs okay i i don't even want to go there uh <laughs> it needs a nice big chunk but i have to accept international law says no okay <laughs> international so, law is now, irrelevant now ben well, Ami says i think the israeli offer was reasonable Okay, that's your, a reasonable guy. That's your, he you seems to, that. even though, okay, I don't want to go there. I've debated him and part I agree with you. Um, but who decides what's reasonable? I think the international community in its political uh, incarnation, the General Assembly, the Security Council, all those UN Security Council resolutions saying the settlements are illegal, annexation of East Jerusalem is null and void, and the International Court of Justice. That to me is a reasonable standard. And by that standard, the Palestinians were asked to make concessions. It is pretty funny that he just, his argument devolves into, Benny Morse's argument devolves into routinely, by the way, no matter how much that other chatter was coping in here, being like, cope and seethe, cope and seethe, I'm not coping, you're coping. His argument literally is, international law is irrelevant. Okay, what's relevant then? Might is right. And he said it multiple times. He's like, <laughs> Malt, you're coping, you're coping. Which I consider unreasonable or the international community considers unreasonable. I think that the issue is when you apply international law or international standards, I, I wouldn't say what Benny Moore says that they're irrelevant, but I think that these have to be seen as informing the conversation. I don't think these are the final shape of the conversation. I don't think historically Israel has ever negotiated within the strict bounds of whether we're talking Resolution 242, whether we're talking about any general, general assembly resolutions. That's just not how these negotiations tend to go. You might consider international opinion on things, but at the end of the day, it's the bilateral negotiations, oftentimes historically started in secret, independent of the international community, um, that end up shaping what the final agreements look like. I think the issue with this broad appeal to international law is, again, going back to my earlier point, about all of the euphemistic words, all it simply does is drive Palestinian expectations up to a level that is never going to be satisfied. Uh, for instance, you can throw that ICJ. The world is doing a really bad disservice to the Palestinians by telling them that they're full-blown human beings that deserve autonomy and emancipation, okay? Israel, which is a naturally occurring phenomena, okay, like a typhoon or an earthquake or, I don't know, like a volcano, is always going to keep oppressing them, and it's really f***ed up that the world is seemingly recognizing the humanity of these Arab barbarian marauder rape, basically serving them a sloppy steak, just a reality that'll never occur. It's like, are there no humans on the other side of this equation? Are the Israelis not human beings? Is this an act of God? Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bernardo, <laughs> is Israel an act of God? How can you sit here in the most imbecilic matter, bring up these assertions devoid of factual basis. You fantastic imbecilic human. <laughs> opinion, all you want, it was an advisory opinion. That came in 2004. Have Palestinians gained more or less land since that 2004 advisory opinion was issued? So what would your standard be then? Both sides have to have a delegation that confronts each other and they assess the realistic conditions on the ground and they try to figure out within the confines right. of international- Wait, so, okay, so then- throw the entire peace process away because you're saying that that's not what happened that does not that is not a good argument for you my friend if you want to present it as uh israel has done its very best 
Because if you ask Benny, who's looking at you right now, like, <laughs> that's what he thinks. Or I don't even know if he believes that. But, like, that literally is the argument that Israel presents. Is like, oh, we went to the table. We had concessions ready to go. Those concessions were reasonable. You just destroyed. This is a pro-Palestinian position. Destiny, I think, maybe got, like, a little too horny or something. Maybe he's, like, a little f***ed up here. Maybe... Maybe uh, uh, Norm got into his head a little bit, but is like low-key making an argument that every Palestinian knows is the reality, which is that the peace process has never been realistic because um, of obviously a lack of serious concessions from Israel, but also because of the fact that Israel has never really looked at the situation on the ground. Actually, the problem that, are reasonable for it. But like, for instance, this statement of like full with retreat from the West Bank, was it 400,000 settlers? How many settlers live in the West Bank now? Probably half a million. Yeah, you're going to 750,000 settlers in the West Bank. You should know this it's like been five months since you uh learned where israel is on a map after first saying that uh you know first saying that uh they deserve to be genocide of the palestinians i mean it is also definitely on the wikipedia page benny is going to say uh it's 750 total 250,000 in uh east jerusalem which uh Benny doesn't believe belongs to Palestine because he's a piece of shit. Uh, and then the rest of it is just West Bank proper beyond the borders or beyond the boundary of occupied Jerusalem. Um, of course, like I said, I mean, Mr. Balotelli, you should know these facts. But Benny Morris does know these facts. And he's a demon regardless. If you include the yeah. Jerusalem suburbs. Yeah, four or five hundred thousand people are never with the Jerusalem suburbs, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no no Damn, that's crazy. Dude, remember when this piece of shit donkey this donkey asshole was claiming that i want to kill israeli children israeli babies settler babies or saying that my assessment is unrealistic when i was saying because of the fact that there are 750,000 israeli settlers right now jewish settlers in the west bank and also in east jerusalem it would be impossible to dispel or to expel every single person there it would literally be a mass catastrophe okay this is precisely the reason why i believe and am committed to a one state solution that was my assessment of the situation and yet his asshat community literally took what i said and flipped it on its head and kept saying oh my god like he just wants to kill israeli babies he wants to kill israeli babies and that a two-state solution is maybe viable in the future but also palestinians are not being genocided and also israel is not an apartheid state even though all of those are correct they, Palestinians are being genocided. Israel is an apartheid state. Jerusalem, are... not settlements. I know that, but that's not what the law. The law calls it null and void. Yeah, yeah, we can say we can say whatever we want until we're blue in the face. But like, there's okay, half a million Israeli people are not being expelled. My, my response: to, You're basically saying, if I understand correctly, there's only one way to resolve this, and that is through direct bilateral negotiation. Probably, yeah. Okay, so or ideally, but I've taken over your house. Okay, you're not going to go to the police because you know the law is of only of limited value. So you come over, and sit in what is now my living room that used to be your living room, and we negotiate. The problem there is that you're not going to get anything unless I agree to it and standards and, and norms and, and law and all the rest of it be damned. So um, you need to take into account that when you're advocating bilateral negotiations, that effectively that gives each of the parties veto power. And in the current circumstances, the Palestinians have already recognized Israel. Um, they have, they have... Wait, what, you keep bringing that up like it's a significant it's concession. True, it's not, and I don't, and even it's if, it's not even true. It doesn't, it doesn't, the, the recognition from Palestine paper. isn't doing anything for you're, 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 Hamas totally rejected. I'm not talking about Hamas. Hamas, Hamas is a majority in the, among the Palestinian people. They won the elections in 2006. Every they, actually, opinion, they, they every, won a majority of the seats. Yes, exactly. They didn't win every, every of opinion poll today says the majority of Palestinians that, that support right. the Hamas. That sounds but right. Hamas absolutely rejects Israel. But, but, so if, if Arafat in uh, 1993 or whatever issued a sort of recognition of Israel. It wasn't a sort of recognition. Okay, a recognition of Israel. It does, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. It's meaningless. And, and any, any, I don't believe that Arafat was sincere about it. Does it matter what you or I think well, about what Well, most Israelis do, and that does matter. Okay, so... But Hamas says no, and Hamas is the majority. Today. So for years, so, so, so for years, the Israeli and U.S. demand was that the Palestinians recognize uh, 242 and 338. They did, but you're saying, okay, we demanded that they do this, but it was meaningless when they did it. it was, then, the, then the demand was, it was that a tactical thing. Yes. Then the demand was that is, uh, the PLO recognize Israel. Tactical. Okay, we demanded that they yeah. did this, and they did it, yeah. but it's meaningless. And they never changed their charter, the PLO. You may remember that. In fact, in 19... they supposedly abrogated the old charter, but never came up with a new one. No, so but, no, but, no new charter. But in 1996, and Farouk Kadumi said, of course, the old charter is still in, yes, in force. Uh, yes. yes, but the point is. You know, the Palestinians' demands are constantly made of them. And when, they, Israel, and when they accede to those demands, they're then told, actually, what you did is meaningless. So here's a new set of demands. I mean, you know, it's like a hamster. No set of it's like a hamster. Let me, let me, let me, it's like a hamster let me, stuck you, in no, a no, wheel. Let me tell you what the bottom line is. will be told, line. if you run fast line. enough, you'll get out of the cage. No, no. The bottom line is that Israel would like 
a Palestinian Sadat. It wants the Palestinians. I, I, listen, listen, this just is let me really finish. a worst case scenario. Okay, let me just because yeah, they shot Sadat. But anyhow, the, 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 the Israelis want, want, want the Palestinians. Israelis want the Palestinians to actually accept the legitimacy of the state of Israel and the Zionist project, and then live side by side with them in two states. That's what the Israelis. I don't even and know. What is I don't even know that's true today. And what is the formal be... position of, of of this Israeli government? No, no, I'm saying I don't know if it exists okay, today. Okay, it's, it's predecessor and it's predecessor, predecessor. Talking talking and it's predecessor. Come on, that's what Israelis want. They want a change of, psych, has, of psyche among the Palestinians. Has and if that doesn't happen, there won't yeah, be a Palestinian I, Mouin, state. Uh, Professor Mar Mouin has an interesting point because because I found I found I know you want to I know you want to forget it just like you want to forget the genocide charge. I know you want to forget that. Well, the Palestinians want to forget it too. It doesn't suit them. But here's the problem, and it's exactly the problem that Palestinians want to what? Forget what? I know you want to forget that. Well, the Palestinians want to forget it too. Okay. But here's the problem. The Palestinians want to forget it too. That doesn't suit them as well. That doesn't even make sense. Dude, that's such a bad... Oh, God. He's not even like... Or is he just saying that as in like the Palestinians want to forget it because it's like too hard for them to comprehend or contend with? Is that what he's trying to say? Because like it, it doesn't make any f sense. Not even a gotcha. I think he's just like shit slinging at this point. Problem. And it's exactly the problem that Mawin just brought up. Now, I read carefully your book, One State, Two States. With all due respect, absolutely a disgrace. Coming, coming from you, coming from you. Most reviewers didn't agree with you. Though. Yeah, coming from you was like you wrote it in your sleep. It's nothing compared to what you wrote before. I don't know why. That's so awesome. An absolute disgrace. You did it. In my opinion, you ruined your reputation. Not totally, but you undermined it with that book. But let's get to the issue that Moeen wrote. Here's what you said. You said, formally, you said, yes, it's true. The Palestinians recognize Israel. But then you said, viscerally, in their heart. What's up? Like, <laughs> I thought Destiny at least like read Benny Morris's book or the Wikipedia summaries. Why is he constantly at odds with a lot of the information that he has presented? Hearts. They, don't. they didn't really recognize yeah. Israel. So I thought to myself, how does... Uh, Professor Cut Morris, no, chest. no, what's in the hearts of Palestinians? I don't know. It's, I, I was, you know, I was, exp I was explained, I was, I was surprised as a historian, you would be talking about what's lurking in the hearts of Palestinians. But then you said something which was really interesting. You said, even if in their hearts they accepted Israel, you said, quote, rationally, they could never accept Israel because they got nothing. They had this beautiful Palestine, and now they're reduced to just a few pieces, a few parcels of land. So, so they will never accept it. So yes, so you That's said, true. There's no way they can accept no, it. No, I, I would say that as well. Yeah, the so, two states so are, as proposed, doesn't exactly make any as, sense. Exactly as Moeen said, you keep moving the, the goalposts goal no, 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 until we reach the point where we realize, according to Benny Morris, there can't be a solution. I so why maybe, don't you just say that outright? Maybe, why I, don't you say I, it outright? That according to you, the Palestinians can never be reasonable. Because according to you... They want all of Palestine. You, according to you, they couldn't possibly... They couldn't possibly agree to a two-state summit because it's such a lousy settlement. Because that's they want what you all said. Of because you, but you said rationally they couldn't accept it, not their feelings. It's both. You said rational. You went from formally, viscerally, rationally. So now we're reaching the point where, according to Benny Morris, the Palestinians can't be reasonable because reasonably they have to reject two states. They want so all of Palestine. Moeen is cor absolutely correct. There's no way to resolve the problem according they to your logic. Palestine. He said that himself. I, he said I, they should dismantle no, that's, Israel. I'm that's what about, he said. What, what I said, didn't say that. Israel. what I said, and, and, I've, and I've written- I'm glad you didn't deny it. I've, 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 I've written extensively on this issue on, on why a two-state settlement is um, still feasible. And I came out in support of that proposition. Perhaps in my heart, you know, you can see Not that I was just bullshitting, but that's what I actually wrote. That was a number of years ago. And, and just to yeah, I forgot that there's literally a Palestinian dude sitting across from him too, where he's like the heart of the Palestinian. The Palestinian mind says one thing, but the heart of the Palestinian is one of a marauder. It thinks a different one. It beats a different way. It's just a matter of historical record. Hey, um, beginning in the early 1970s, um, there was fierce debate within the Palestinian national movement about whether to except accept or reject. And, and there were three schools of thought. There was one that would accept nothing less than the total liberation of Palestine. There was a second that accepted what was called the establishment of a fighting national authority on Palestinian soil, which they saw as, the begin as a springboard for the total liberation of Palestine. And there was a third school that believed that under current dynamics and so on, that, that um, they should go for a two-state settlement. And, and our friend and correspondent, Wouter uh, Lowerse, has written a very perceptive article on um, when the PLO, already in 1976, came out in open support of a um, two-state uh, resolution at the Security Council. PLO accepted it. Israel, of course, rejected it. But the resolution didn't pass because the U.S. and the U.K. vetoed it. It was both of them. I think it was nine to five. Ah, okay. Yeah. But the but fact of the matter is, 
that the PLO came to accept um, a two-state settlement. Why they did it, I think is irrelevant. Um, and subsequently, the PLO acted on the basis of seeking to achieve a two-state settlement. The reason, I think, and I think... Yeah, when the Palestinians accept a two-state solution, they're doing it to garner support from the international community, and it's bad. They're doing it for a nefarious reason. When the Palestinians actually take up violent resistance against the apartheid regime, they're once again doing it in a bad way, and they shouldn't do it. At a certain point, you have to realize, like, nothing the Palestinians can do is actually allowed for you because for your genocidal ethnostate to exist as a project and, and exist in practice, okay, you, you can't have Palestinians exist there. There's no way that Palestinians can actually perfectly resist Israel's apartheid. And by the way, they can't even perfectly resist it by dying because then, then Zionists say, well, they're dying for Pallywood. They're dying for the Western world to look at and sympathize with their position. There is no way, like, the perfect solution to this literally is for the Palestinians to magically and quietly perish from the land. Like, just disappear. Israel kills them and still paints them as actually willing participants in the slaughter that are dying deliberately. Hamas putting them in the direction of our missiles. Norm, you've written about this. The reason that Arafat was so insistent on getting um, uh, minimally acceptable terms for a two-state settlement at Camp David and afterwards. Is that a real take? What the f My favorite is when someone first finds out like a Hasbara point, like a Hasbara talking point for the first time. When it doesn't come from the mouth of Jake Tapper as though it's like factually accurate, it definitely comes, it definitely hits a little different. Yes, Israelis, literally Zionists, okay, will regularly reach that depth of humanity. Uh, inhumanity, sorry. No, not photogenic dead babies. Telegenically dead babies. That is what Benjamin Netanyahu said in 2018. Telegenically dead children. That was the term he used. It was precisely because he knew that once he signed, that was all the Palestinians were going to get. If his intention had been, you know, I'm not accepting Israel, I simply want to springboard, he would have accepted a Palestinian state in Jericho. But he didn't. He insisted. That's something I've never understood. He should have logically accepted the springboard and then from there launched no, his next stage. Well, he, he should have done that. If, if, international if law in would put a real constraint on him. No, but once he accepted, it was over. Constitutionally, he was incapable of signing. Well, that's, if, I don't know if, that. If you're right that he should, he should have accepted it. But if you're correct, yeah. okay, that, that he was really out to all eliminate all Israel, then, then he wouldn't have cared about the borders. He wouldn't have cared about what the thing said about refugees. He would have gotten a sovereign state and used that to achieve that purpose. But, but I think it was precisely because he recognized that he was not negotiating for a springboard. He was negotiating permanent status that he was such a stickler. By the way, he said that on CNN, they want to pile up as many civilian dead as they can. They use telegenically dead Palestinians for their cause. They want the more dead, the better. That is a shocking, shockingly inhumane thing to say. That was in 2018. Or no, it was before then. It was 2020, uh, 2014. I thought it was uh, during the Great March of Return. He said something similar in that. In that, uh, He said similar than, something similar then too. 2014 is after the first siege, or not the first siege, but one of the sieges. <sighs> Joseph Goebbels, November 16, 1941, essay in Das Reich, addressing German sympathy for German Jews, forced to wear yellow stars. The Jews gradually are having to depend more and more on themselves and having recently found a new trick. They knew the good-natured German Michael in us, always ready to shed sentimental tears for the injustice done to them. One suddenly has the impression that the Berlin Jewish population consists only of little babies whose childish helplessness might move us, or else fragile old ladies. The Jews send out their pitiable. They may confuse some harmless souls for a while. They may confuse some harmless souls for a while, but not us. We know exactly what the situation is. About the details. The second, this just yeah. as a factual matter, he wasn't such a stickler. When they asked him how many refugees, the numbers. It was the, a principle was rather than the, the principle. He said I would be pragmatic uh, about it. Yes, and apply. the numbers that were used at um, Annapolis were between 100 and 250,000 refugees over 10 years. That was the number. Arafat, when he was asked at Camp David, he kept saying, I care about the Lebanese, uh, the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, which came to about 300,000, which was a large concession from the, whether you accept the number or not, that he wasn't talking about 6 million. He was talking about between 100 and 250,000 over 10 years. Now, the best offer that came from the Palestinian... Yeah, this is very important to also understand because it shows uh, the conciliatory tone uh, and, and the concessions made by the Palestinian side where Arafat time and time again very publicly declared throughout the peace process 
that they would concede to Israel's demographic concerns. These are key words to pay attention to. <clears throat> this means that they recognize that Israel as an apartheid state wanted to exist as a uh, demographic majority Jewish state. So the right to return to Palestinian territory would factor the apartheid regime's own demographic interests as an as his maintenance of an ethno state and even that was beyond the pale Indians, excuse me the best offer that came from israel was the omer offer can we just pretend like we didn't all lay out the exceptionally pessimistic uh view well, of a two-state hold on a second two-state solution let's pretend that in five years and ten years a, a two-state peace settlement is reached and, and as historians you will still be here writing about it 20 years from now how would it have happened I think that historically, I think that the big issue is, I think that both sides have had their own internal motivations to fight because they feel like they have something to gain from it. But I think as time has gone on, unfortunately, the record proves that the Palestinian side is delusional. The longer that the conflict endures, the worse position they'll be in. But for some reason, they've never had a leader that convinced them of that as much. That Arafat thought that if he held on, there was always a better deal around the corner. Um, Abbas is more concerned with trying to maintain any legitimacy amongst Palestinians. I like that you just, I like that we're just avoiding exactly uh, the, the, the references to historical fact that both Rabani and Finkelstein just made. I'm conveniently jumping over that point to simply say the exact opposite occurred. Um, will my perspective actually have any quotes, any historical facts? No, pure conjecture, purely made up. I have, uh, it is devoid, utterly and entirely of any kind of historical basis. Palestinians than actually trying to uh, negotiate anything realistic with Israel, that Palestinians are always incentivized to feel like as long as they keep fighting, either the international community is going to save them with the 5 millionth UN resolution condemning whatever, that another ICJ advisory opinion is finally going to lead to the expulsion of half a million Jews from the West Bank, or that some other international body, uh, the ICJ and the genocide charge is going to come and save the Palestinians, as long as they, in their mind. I like that he's saying that 400,000, 400,000 or 750,000 Jews are not going to be forcibly displaced from the West Bank, but 2 million Palestinians in Gaza, well, they can get the smoke. This is what happens when you engage in post hoc rationalizations after you have made up your mind about Israel having a right to do a genocide, which you refuse to recognize is genocide any longer. You did recognize that it was genocide, and then you realized that people were yelling at you for that point, so you decided to go, actually, it's not a genocide, lol. Argument is completely, the only thing this argument presents is just confidence falsely placed upon your own intellect. There's nothing else here. He just simply is saying, no, actually, and, and repeating over and over again, no, actually, Palestinians never conceded. Finkelstein and Rabani show clear points of concession from the Palestinian side and detail it and literally mention as to why even those concessions were not listened to, even though those concessions were ridiculous to begin with, like they were above and beyond those concessions were above and beyond what is normally expected of humans or any kind of envoy that speaks for an entire population. And his retaliation simply was, no, actually. And also there's no way that you know, 750,000 Israelis are going to be forcibly relocated off the West Bank. Okay, so what do you do with the 5 million Palestinians living in the territories that Israel is, is slowly carving out? Is it not an even greater act of inhumanity to forcibly continue to expel them? feel like somebody is coming to save them, then they feel like they're going to have the ability to get something better in the future. But the reality is, is all of the good partners for peace that the Palestinians had have completely and utterly abandoned them. Uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, the Gulf states, uh, whether you're talking bilateral peace or the Abraham Accords, most of the Arab leaders in negotiating peace with Israel have just not had as much of an interest in maintaining the uh, ma maintaining the rights and the representations of what the Palestinian people want. And the only people they have today to, to draw legitimacy from or to have on their side to argue with them are people that, I guess, write books or tweet or people in the international community. Saying that there's no one advocating for the Palestinian cause in the region which is, of course, due to American intervention and involvement that made it so, neutering any kind of allegiance that Palestinians would have. There is one kind of allegiance that the Palestinian population has from a regional actor. That regional actor is Iran. So I guess maybe they're not left out to dry in the way that he is suggesting. There also, uh, you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, you have Iran in the region, and you have Yemen. But of course, those guys are also bad. Because there is, once again, no way, there is no way that you will concede to the humanity of the Palestinians. If you do not see them as humans, and you see them as simply a nuisance, 
all of your argument is going to revolve around this. Yeah. Whenever someone advocates for Palestinians, they are conveniently called terrorists. Even in the United States of America, there is now a majority. There's now a majority that is advocating for Palestinians, but we it's falling on deaf ears. So, of course, he can conveniently ignore all of that, just like the majority, the overwhelming majority of Arab citizens living in those very same Abraham Accords states, for example, in the MENA region and in the Gulf states that are advocating for the, for the livelihoods of the Palestinians, and yet it's still falling on deaf ears because our governments, whether they are directly authoritarian, a monarchy, or even this theoretical democracy that we have in the United States of America, do not listen to the wishes of the people. There are plenty of people that are advocating for the, for the well-being of the Palestinians. The Palestinians are not abandoned, okay? It simply doesn't matter because there is no real democracy, just like there is no real human rights, which Benny Morris at least, you know, says nobody gives a shit about uh, international law. Destiny tries to claim he cares about international law while simultaneously hand-waving it away and also claiming that it is an impossibility to advocate for the Palestinians and every single person has actually stopped advocating for Palestinians. Well, yeah, okay. So what are they to do? How can they defend themselves? Do you not think that they have an honest and reasonable claim to say, stop killing us, to stop forcing us to exist under this brutal colonial apartheid regime? I think it's a perfectly just thing to say. I think it's perfectly moral for them to not only advocate for their emancipation, but to rise up in arms against it. ...that do resolutions or amnesty international reports. And the reality is we can scream until we're blue in the face on these things. None of it has gotten any closer to helping the Palestinians in any sense of the word. The condition... Yeah, this is like fake posturing, like, oh, I really do care about the Palestinians, but no one is like actually interested. But, but it doesn't make any sense when the guy saying it is like openly talking about Arabs as like dogs and has openly stated that he thinks the genocide of the Palestinian population is actually perfectly... Uh, well within the rights of Israel. Simultaneously, he denies Israel is doing. But if they were doing the genocide, it would be just. Which, by the way, for the record, is exactly what the f Nazis say about the Holocaust. They, one, deny the Holocaust ever even happened, but then they will very quickly say, but if it did, it was good, and it should have done. It should have been done even harder. This is just pure fascist bullshit and has only gotten worse the settlements only continue to expand the military operations are only to get more brutal uh the, the blockade is going to continue to have worse effects as long as we use international law as the basis and there isn't a strong a sadat like palestinian leader that's willing to come up and confront israel with the with the brave peaceful negotiations to force them to, to acquiesce nothing is going to happen and i think that the issue you come up with is you know whether it's people like norm they talk about how brave the october 7th attacks were or how much respect they have for those fighters the the Israel, in a way, and I think people said as much about Netanyahu, um, the right wants violence from the Palestinians because it always gives them a perpetual excuse to further the conflict. But we have to go in uh, in October 7th, we've got to remove Hamas. So we can't trust these people in the West. We have to do the night raids um, because, you know, the second intifada, uh, you know, it made us feel like the Palestinian people didn't want trust with us. I feel like the, the, the biggest thing that would force Israel to change its path would be an actual, a real, not for like two weeks, but an actual peaceful Palestinian leader, somebody committed to peace that is able to apply those standards and hold the entire region of Palestine. Yeah, except there was one and Israel used his, his meaningful concessions that Finkelstein and Rabani correctly and accurately described. Israel used those concessions as though it was nothing. Israel used the peace process as though Israel used the peace process as a mechanism to consistently uh, get Western cover and Western support for settlement expansion in the West Bank, a fact that every Palestinian saw with their own two eyes, impossible to avoid. You also personally go back and forth on whether those con uh, cons uh, those those uh, concessions existed at all. He keeps saying there there were no concessions made. We need a real peace partner, and it's like they show exactly why there was a real peace partner in Palestine, on the Palestinian front to which he conveniently does not address at all and moves on and just keeps saying, no, there is no peace partner on the Palestinian side and there should be. This is not a way to argue. You're just simply going, no, I don't agree with you. They keep bringing historical facts, okay? He is just not doing that at all and keeps saying, no, that didn't happen. Palestine to those standards, because I think over time, the mounting pressure from without the, the, the international community and the mounting pressure from within, because Israel hosts a lot of its own criticism. We talk about Beth Salem, we talk about like Israel will host a lot of its own criticism. I think that that pressure would force Israel towards an actual peace agreement, but it's never going to come through violence. Historically, it hasn't. Um, and, and in the modern day, violence has just hurt the Palestinians more and more. If you paint a picture of the future, now is a good moment for both Palestine and Israel to get new leadership. 
Netanyahu's on the way out. Hamas possibly is on the way out. Who should rise to the top such that a peaceful settlement can be reached? The, the problem is, like Annie said, yeah, it's community. difficult because Hamas enjoys so much widespread support um, amongst the Palestinians. Yeah, all of this argument reduces to there's no apartheid because I don't think so. There's no genocide because I do not think so. And pointing out the flaws of the Israeli government makes me less likely to agree with you, so be nicer. Absolutely. Ridiculous. People, I think that the, well, I don't know, there's opinions on whether democracy are pushing them towards elections was the right or wrong idea. But with like an Islamic fundamentalist government for, for Hamas, I don't know if a negotiation with Israel ever happens there. And then when the, when the international... Yeah, by the way, uh, Israel doesn't have a Jewish fundamentalist government right now. Itamar ben Givir and Smotrich are uh, perfectly fine and well within their rights to have the opinions that they hold. But... But Hamas, that, that's the, the real scary Islamist fundamentalist governance. Ridiculous. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. Like the real both sidest approach. It, look, I will say this much. If Destiny actually wasn't so intellectually lazy and, and, uh, and, and living in a world where like everyone is constantly hyping him up. So he just like legitimately started believing the shit that people were saying about how brilliant he is. He would at least do his due diligence and argue the liberal Zionist position. He would say things along the lines of to make himself seem like he is a uh, that make himself seem like he's morally consistent. He would do what Chuck Schumer is doing yesterday. OK. No, it is lazy. It's not laziness. He's farming controversy. No, absolutely not. It's intellectually lazy. You can still farm controversy by defending a genocidal apartheid regime, but you can do a better job of arguing on that front by simply stating things like, well, actually, both sides do have some issues with fundamentalism. To, to move the conversation away from apartheid and genocide, if you want to do that correctly, you need to frame it as, well, you know, this is a religious conflict. And, you know, I don't like the Netanyahu government either. I actually don't agree with uh, Smotrich. I actually don't agree with... Uh, with with Ben Gvir and there are plenty of people in Israel that don't either and this was a coalition that the corrupt Netanyahu government put together these are the ways that you would have to frame it if you weren't intellectually lazy and a charlatan to be like and yes while concessions were made you would you would pull up Rabin as like this incredible beacon of hope uh that that genuinely was interested in in uh defending the statehood of the Palestinians and whatnot will you stop teaching people on how to be Souls. No, this is called steel manning, and that's precisely what I'm doing right now to demonstrate that I understand the other side's argument better than this clown ass is, 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 could ever comprehend it. At least Benny, to a certain degree, is trying to do that. Meanwhile, Destiny just keeps repeating Hasbro talking points that are completely, like, they come across completely idiotic because he's not even, he's not even addressing any of the points that Finkelstein or Rabani are bringing to the table that's a that's a massive problem he's not engaging with anything he's just repeating the lines over and over and over again he's literally turned into the talking point machine that he used to intellectually dismantle through logic and reasoning that's it that's all he's doing pressure is always you know 67 borders infinite right of return for refugees and a oh, i said hasbra it's just the israeli word for propaganda or sorry what is it retelling of the truth or something to Convince? Osborough is not Hoscourt. Little withdrawal of Israel from all these lands to even start negotiations. Um, I just don't see realistically, on the Palestinian side, no negotiations are ever going to start in a, in a place that Israel is willing to accept. If you want to um, dismiss international law, to that's explain. fine. But then Sorry. you have to do it consistently. Yeah, it just means to explain. Sorry, but is You can't um, set standards for the Palestinians, um, but reject uh, applying those standards to Israel. Um, if we're going to have the law of the jungle, then we can all be beasts, and not only some of us. And I think, so it's either that, or you have certain agreed uh, standards that, that are intended to regulate our conduct, all of our conduct, not just some of us. Well, so that's a fundamental thing to abandon. Well, you're saying, you know, international law and the millionth UN resolution, you're being very dismissive about all well, this. And that's fine. Well, but then you have to be dismissive saying, like, for instance, like, across the board. That was a chapter six resolution. That's non-binding. But 242 is binding. What is, what, is absolutely binding. Not. What, is, what is binding? Do you know anything about how the UN system binding, works? If you read the language of the resolution, binding okay. is typically if it commits you to yeah, upholding okay. a particular international law or if it establishes a new law. You just throw out words. You hear binding, does not 242 binding. Even, does 242 Chapter mention a Palestinian you, state? No. Norm. Of course That's not. That's part of the okay, problem. Then, that yes, was the exactly. reason so, why the sorry, Palestinians let me, let me didn't want to recognize 242, because they only referred at the very end. Yeah, yeah, but the PLO recognized problem. 181 yeah. and 242. When they yeah, but hold on, so hold on. Every United Nations Security Council resolution, irrespective of under which chapter it was adopted, is by definition binding. Binding not only... Yeah, why would they... What? what what are resolutions then? They're just throwing it out, dude. They're just 
saying things. They're just talking shit. That's why they're doing it. There's no legal basis for any UN resolution if you don't consider it to be binding. And if you don't consider it to be binding, then yes, you and Rabani's assessment is correct. You're very callously saying that they're just words and, and it's not important. It's ridiculous. Why would you even bring it up then? Then you're basically reaffirming the position that Benny Morris had, which is that nobody actually follows international law, unless it suits my argument as I'm trying to uphold uh, the, the Palestinian resistance groups to some of the minutia of international law in an effort to justify Israel's, uh, you know, forward-facing offensive genocidal campaign. Security Council, but on every member state of the UN. That's, read the UN Charter. It's, it's black and white. Sure, uh, people okay. can look that now up. Regarding, but yes. the language even of 242 is kept intentionally vague such that it doesn't actually provide, again, the it's final contours. It's actually not that vague it's because the term, the term land for peace originates in 242. Sure, the but idea the is about territorial acquisition and Israel's need to give it okay. up was kept vague. Okay. That's why in 79 Israel asked, saw that they fulfilled their question. obligations under 242 Allow me points in terms of, of information. withdraw. Allow me points of information. <sighs> Yeah. The first principle in UN Resolution 242 is the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force. Which is meaningless. That it may be meaningless to you, Mr. It was Bunnell. Meaningless to everyone okay, in the Mr. Bunnell, that principle was adopted by the Friendly Nations Resolution, the UN General Assembly in 1970. That resolution was then reiterated in the International Court of Justice dis, uh, ruling uh, advisory opinion in yeah. 2004. That was the basis of the coalition against Iraq when it acquired Kuwait and then declared it a province of Kuwait. Yeah, which that Arafat is, supported. That's what's called. That's what's that's called. That's true. Arafat, under, Arafat did support it. Arafat did support it. That's why it's not, it's a shitty deal with the Oslo I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. It's not okay. accurate that Arafat okay. endorsed. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to go not, there. Okay. Uh, the it's called under thing. international. No. no, it is actually irrelevant to the point of Israel. No. Law are use Kogans or peremptory norms of international law, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. That is not controversial. It's not vague. You couldn't put it more succinctly. You cannot acquire territory by force under international law. Well, on the West that Bank is, before 67. Who owned the Gaza Strip before 67? Mr. Bunnell, don't change the subject. If you don't know what you're talking it's about, about at least you say, have the you know, at least have the humility. Two, you talk how, about how close chapter is two six. four two? Got you know, <laughs> oh, Mr. Benelli, have some humility. I am trying to reason with you, Mr. Benelli, Mr. Bonicelli. I'm trying so hard. Bringing your child to work day is never a good idea in retrospect. Yeah. They even brought out the iPad for him too. So he could just like busy himself, you know, so that he could just like be preoccupied while the adults were talking. And now he's bored of the iPad games. So he's, he's just. No. That is. Seven. Who that is. That again? Before 67. So, Mr. Bunnell, don't change the subject. If you don't know what you're talking it's not about, about at least you can say, have the curious, at know, least how have close the humility. Is two, you talk how, about how close chapter has two four two gotten? You don't know how, chapter how close six. has two four two gotten know to the Palestinians? Six peace. from tweet five. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's just so embarrassing. Huh? At least have some humility. Between us, we've read maybe ten thousand books on the topic, and you've read two. Wikipedia entries, and you start talking about chapter six. Do you know what chapter seven is? Answer me. Answer Do you know what question. chapter North, seven answer is? Answer me a question. How close has 242 gotten the Palestinians to a state? You know, How close has the 2004 that. advisory okay. opinion gotten the... the He's 100% so cooked, so cumstered, and so dumpstered that, like, he literally is just going back to, like, well, you know, it hasn't worked. Yeah, dumbass, if it had worked, we wouldn't be having this conversation. This is the fundamental flaw in arguing from a liberal position that is completely empty, completely devoid of morality, okay? He's getting mogged, <laughs> yeah. He's getting butt mogged by Norm Finkelstein. <laughs> this is the issue. The issue is the moment that he's like, the moment that his, his 
uh, intellectual rigor is called into question, he immediately has to resort back to like, well, it didn't work. Here's the problem. And this is reactionary thinking, okay? This is reactionary thinking. This is the problem with reactionary thinking, which is that what do Republicans do all the time? What do conservatives in American politics and American domestic politics always do? They point to the inability of change as a reason as to why things can't get better and mustn't get better. They'll always say, oh, well, uh, what about the homeless veterans when talking about immigration? They only talk about mental health and only talk about health care and access to mental health care when talking about it as a as a misdirection away from gun violence, okay? You are not actually interested in addressing the issue head on. You are deflecting away from it. And that's precisely why he turned around and went from talking about what is in 242 all the way to, well, it didn't work. You just jumped multiple points over to a position that everybody understands. The entire reason why this debate is happening is because UN resolutions don't uh, haven't actually brought about change haven't actually brought about peace everybody there understands this you can't just like point to that the only people that will consider you to be a, a brilliant intellectual person are people who are too stupid are people who are too stupid to recognize that like every single person in that room does understand that point that is not even a, that you're not bringing up like a counter. Yeah, it is the Ouroboros self-fulfilling prophecy. It is not an argument. The West Bank settlement. What's your alternative? The alternative is, you is, just, is, you is just, not this, whatever this making money but, off the conflict but, is, the, the actual I'll alternative. Yeah, and then he's saying, he's ascribing uh, a nefarious purpose. He immediately hits the, you're actually grifting. I'm not grifting for assuming the position that is infinitely more favorable, okay, for money. A position that I didn't even put a lot of thought or effort into. Okay. You must be grifting though. Pure projection. Another point for griftonomics. Another point for reactionary debating. I love that uh, Mike and I talked about this earlier because he's hitting the, he's hitting the full Monty here. He's hitting all the talking points, making an assertion that your the other side of the issue is being argued, not because one of them is a literal Palestinian, okay, and and the other person is unironically dedicated his whole life to documenting these atrocities and has suffered great financial blows. He's been blacklisted from academia for calling out Alan Dershowitz, a tenured Harvard professor for plagiarism. It is ridiculous to act like there is any sort of like comparison. There's any sort of moneyed interest at play when talking about the Palestinian side of the argument versus the Israeli side of the argument. You got APAC, you got J Street, you got Democratic Majority for Israel. It is ridiculous. There is no Palestinian equivalent. What a laughable concept to say that one of the most unpopular things to say that is true for literally decades, for decades, that Norm Finkelstein has advocated for because of his stubbornness and his endless pursuit to actually truthfully address the the uh, the issue on hand. Yeah, Christians United for Israel is even larger than APAC. That's another dude. So many Christian evangelical Zionist groups are unironically infinitely larger than any Jewish backed Zionist lobby. Okay, so much larger. Christian Zionists, pound for pound, well, not per capita, but Christian Zionists actually give significantly more money to Israel than American Jews do, okay? A lot more of them out there, obviously. So you are right about that. They are also at the forefront of settlement expansion as well. It is such a ridiculous assertion to make, and it is one, yeah, they're calling Norma Grifter, which is psychotic. Like, if anything, listen, listen. You might disagree with the way that Norm conducts himself. You might disagree with some of his uh, contemporary analysis as it pertains to identity politics. I certainly do. But you can never call him a grifter. This dude is honest to a fault. Even his enemies in academia don't go there. But of course, the person that's going to drop that, especially as it pertains to the issue of Palestinian advocacy, as though there is money to be made advocating for the palestinians who have nothing is so 
laughable as you sit there and defend the genocidal apartheid regime of Israel and are not even doing a good job at it. The, the actual Destiny alternative. Destiny should talk yes, about you're, making you're money media, off yeah, you're of media idiocy. Blitz, where you go yeah. and talk to 50 million you're, different uh, people you're about your early. Yeah. Notice how the conversation, every single time this dumb opens his mouth, devolves into nothingness. It's just shit slinging. Norm does a fair bit of ad hominems as well. Okay. But at least his ad hominems come after direct assessment of historical fact. I don't think Destiny brought a single factually accurate point to the conversation that at least Benny Morris had not presented before him. Not one. All pure personal opinion, devoid of any sort of factual analysis, devoid of, of even a significant counter to any of the historic truths that Finkelstein and Robani expertly delivered. Not a single retort was made. Not even an attempt at a decent retort was made. It is crazy. I've been walking around the house calling my wife Mr. Borelli all day. So really it's that Steve isn't engaging with Finkelstein in any good way rather than the other way around. Stevie isn't engaging with Finkelstein's argument. Yeah, no, he. I, I've, I've been watching this. We're watching for four hours and 20 minutes and I haven't seen a single instance where like Rabani or Finkelstein brings up a point. I won't say this about Benny Morris. Benny Morris does address some of the points that they make. Obviously, I disagree with his opinion, but at least he's offering them the dignity of responding to the points that they're making. Destiny does not do this once. Not once. All he does is basically rephrase Benny Morris's argument in a worse way. In a more confident way, certainly, where he has this like position of unearned authority despite the fact that it is very obvious for anyone who knows even a little bit about the history of the conflict, or at least, like, you don't even need to know the history of the conflict. Like, if you have eyes and ears and a heart, and you saw what has happened since October 7, it's pretty easy for you to recognize that, like, when Destiny says things like, oh, the genocide is not happening, there's no ethnic cleansing, or whatever. The if you've even, like, paid a little bit of attention to what's going on since October 7, you unironically would be like, what the is this guy saying oh i'm i i at first i said you need to have someone that is devoid of like uh real historical facts in their argumentation to be able to defend israel adequately i actually take that back a liberal zionist any professional liberal zionist would have done a better job than destiny destiny is basically doing the rabbi shmuley technique of yelling flailing his arms and, and consistently just staying on message, repeating talking points devoid of any sort of facts with no retorts to the arguments presented by Finkelstein or Rabani. It's pretty crazy. He doesn't go as far as Rabbi Shmuley does at times, but that doesn't change the reality that like his arguments are so hollow. He is completely out of his element, so out of depth. Your but solution, he has right? a point. The, the issue is you have all to these negotiate. resolutions have gotten mm -hmm. the Palestinians no Nothing. closer yeah, but hold on to a, a state because they you're, haven't you're been earlier. enforced because of the U.S. veto. They're not going to be enforced. Well, well, wait, 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 wait. Okay, no, no, if I may, if you know, I may, that, the IPG, you, you, you know what? You know what, Professor Morris? About the case for genocide, Professor Morris. Because of your logic, and I'm not disputing it, that's why October 7th happened. Oh my God. Because they're, I mean, he's right. Hospital? I mean, has Israel like full on bombed a hospital? I yes. don't think they have. Which, what, what? El Shifa. Oh. That's the one from like three months ago, right? Yeah. Um, let me make a note of that. Um, besides El Shifa. <laughs> Is Chad going, oh no. <laughs> no way, Lamau. Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Yeah, by the way, uh, Israel has not stopped blowing up hospitals since then, before then, after then. Oh, man. I did have Mark on. I didn't even know he was, like, supposed to be debating Destiny afterwards or before. I don't even know when they debated. But I think this... His chat believes Al Shifa wasn't bombed by Israel, so they're saying Game of Thrones, the mark. Shifa, have they bombed any hospitals? I mean, he didn't remember. No, bro, they're making fun of him. They did not bomb at Omegalol, to my knowledge. I mean, Game of Thrones debate lost. Don't even think about that. He debated beforehand and said you were his political nemesis. Oh, yeah, yeah. He could try the paternalistic argument in that Israel is the most legitimate authority because it's the most developed economy. economically. Mr. Botticelli strikes me as lazy and unimaginative. Yes, as someone who is like 
carefully comb through pretty much every line of argumentation on the Israeli side who has maybe near uh, Norm Finkelstein levels of autism when it comes to simply just the talking points. Nothing beyond that, okay? I can tell you that there are infinitely better ways to argue on behalf of Israel here. And considering that this is supposed to go out to a, by and large, like a political audience of, of centrists who are trying to arrive at the truth to the marketplace of ideas where interlocutors are, are being bested by better arguments, he absolutely could have brought to the table, he absolutely could have brought to the table a better argument by assuming the liberal Zionist talking points rather than the most like insane ones being like, oh man, um, there's no genocide. There was no options left for those people. Exactly what Moen said. And now said. what options are left? After you know, October 7th, what's the I, I, what's, I, uh, what's the option? The only oh, option is listen, conflict. Listen to this. Wait, the only Mr. option is Mr. is now an expert on Palestinian Hold on. mentality. You're, you're contradicting you know about, yourself. I only deal, I only deal with facts. I only deal with facts. Chapter but five. Egypt didn't find it necessary to, to negotiate peace with the Palestinians. Jordan didn't find it necessary to negotiate peace with the Palestinians. The Abraham Accords didn't include the Palestinians. Despite all of the international Everybody, move You're contradicting yourself. On the one hand, and you're saying all the Palestinians do is fight and violence and terrorism and all the rest of it. My go. But on the other hand, you're saying they're expecting salvation from uh, uh, from UN resolutions and international court. Those aren't violent. They're, no, they're, but it's part of maintaining. It's the, it's, the, it's the continual putting off of negotiating They've any negotiated. solution. They've negotiated. As in when Arafat I think takes he 10 says days to respond. I when Arafat said, takes 10 days to respond. Oh, dude, Arafat didn't. Arafat had to take 10 days of response, so I think it's okay. Never mind. I think Mawain, all over the I world think to go and visit said, friends. Yes. I think that's what putting the conflict off they indefinitely. They accepted two states in 1975. Brace yourself. Why didn't they, they accept did, the Congress of the Senate then? No, this that's 50 this years is a ago. This is a legend. That's a half century there's, ago. There's a very, no, no, they didn't a, accept the two state solution. He quoted system. a very good article. There's, there's, you can quote right. Arafat talking about how he's lying and he's just going to use in 94 and in 95 when he's but, making but, trips around the world, how he just wanted to use this as the starting ground. I'm sorry, I can talk slow. You can watch YouTube and slow it down to 0.5 speed if you don't understand what I'm saying. Let me There's a very, there's a very lengthy history of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. You want to deny that those negotiations negotiations took place where it feels like there was a, a good what faith effort like? where where there was a good feels faith like. effort where it was a good we faith have effort a written record with all due respect we have yeah uh, oh it, it just guys 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 everybody stop talking destiny doesn't feel like a good faith effort was initiated by the palestinian side so it doesn't really matter when he has no answer to the many concessions that arafat made that doesn't matter because he doesn't feel like there was a good faith negotiation happening. He doesn't feel that way. Who cares about what history says? This guy who thought Recep Tayyip Erdogan was the mother president of Syria or the president of Israel like three weeks ago. That guy doesn't feel like after he read some of the Wikipedia pages specifically to draw up like what he thinks is a good narrative and good talking points. He doesn't feel like that. But remember, he only argues in fact. Here's a fact. He couldn't find Israel on a map. He had already at that point decided that Israel should do a genocide and the Palestinians should just be genocided quietly. But he couldn't factually point to Israel on the map. He knows now. He's read up. And he doesn't feel like the Palestinians made a good for, uh, faith yes, effort. He must be a fucking you don't loser. know Francis. I don't know who Francisco Franco is, but he must be a fucking You loser. don't know Francisco Franco? He's Bruh. got $2 supporters. Bruh. $2 supporters. Yeah. Bashar al-Assad, is that this guy? No. Fuck, wait, which, who, wait, who is this, who are these people? Am I just supposed to know? It'd be nice if you did, since, you know, you're talking about it as though you are the authority on the subject matter. This isn't him. Oh, Erdogan. Oh, Erdogan. Is it Erdogan? Erdogan? I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. When did he become president of Israel? Or, or Yahweh. Were the Gospels originally written in Greek? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not Arabic or whatever? Or No. They were written in Koine Greek. What was the yes. Jewish old shit? Well, Hebrew, and Hebrew, there, there yeah. was some Aramaic in the Old Testament as well. Okay, yeah. Aramaic, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, but m mostly. He's also much nicer to these Nazis, like, seemingly, than he is to Norm Finkelstein.
somehow. He's the Ian Miles Chong of Palestine. <laughs> He's kind of scared to have such strong and frightening opinions without knowing the basics. It's not. It's actually very profitable, it seems, especially if you have the confidence of stupidity backing you and an army of dick riders who position you as the foremost authority. Yeah, imagine knowing less than Nazis about history. You didn't know who Franco was. Actually embarrassing Lamau is right. Mostly Hebrew. Yes. Uh Iowa. Okay, I'll take it. All right, okay, okay. Not too bad. Not too bad. Do Europe, bro, I don't even know half the countries in Europe, okay. Why don't you point out what Steven says that's wrong? I did. I very clearly detailed exactly his line of argumentation and why it's wrong. Because Finkelstein and Robani brought up clear concessions from the Arafat team multiple times. He did not address a single point that they made and simply just washed over it and said, no, there were no concessions because it doesn't feel like there are any good concessions that he gave. Now I'm moving beyond his feelings and showing you why his feelings are relatively unimportant in the matter because who gives a f what his feelings are on the situation they're addressing historical facts but beyond that his feelings extra don't matter in this circumstance because he's also devoid of like the factual basis to develop feelings on the issue he's just feeling from the outside unless we're just going to debate on like we're going to have actual academics on to, to, to talk about your own personal feelings it's like yeah sorry dude I don't feel like the Palestinians actually did something. I don't think the Palestinians actually did a real, real, uh, you know, justified uh, uh, concession here. At least he could have done, at least the least he could have done is like address some of the talking points, right? If you're going to talk about how the Palestinians offered zero concessions, he could have just talked about like what, what those, how, how unreasonable those concessions were, for example. Of course, your channel runs only on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yes, dude. Yes, it does. Do you have an issue with that? I think it's one of the most important uh, geopolitical issues. It is literally an ongoing genocide that the government that I pay taxes to is facilitating. I think that's pretty f important. I'm a nerd when it comes to the whole peace process. These knowledge are absolutely embarrassing. Months before negotiations started, Amos Malka, Shimbet research head, told the cabinet Arafat couldn't accept less than 93% of the West Bank. That territory is the primary issue and the refugees was a leverage chip. Barack literally refused to accept that and replied, you think I'm offering... You think if I offered him 90%, he wouldn't accept? Nonsense. Something you said recently rings in my head now all the time. I live in constant self-doubt and the arrogance and certainty of these people, uh, these people have without an inch of self-reflection pisses me off to no end. Yeah, 100%. Talking about your Twitter tabs? He's literally watching right now talking about my Twitter tabs? Yeah, dude. I know. I got Twitter tabs, dude. You know, from actual reputable journalists. Maybe instead of reading Wikipedia to like browse for talking points as he gets like humiliated by guys whose actual work makes it into the Wikipedia pages, uh, he would have a better understanding of the situation. You know what I mean? Keep coping though, buddy. Keep coping. I swear people still think you're smart. I promise. When I look at Wikipedia, more often than not, I'm usually referencing the journals that are breaking stories. But hey, you've presented a comfortable narrative to your audience, hoping that they don't watch, hoping that they don't actually make up their own conclusions. When, I, when I'm on stream and I'm looking at Twitter, Okay, I'm looking at the actual journalists that are breaking stories on developing issues. I then also follow through and have those journalists on stream to interview them. Denmark, uh, Denmark, Denmark, Denmark. Denmark really owns this? That's so wild. Why? Honestly, uh, I'm pro genocide. Like, it's not, it sounds really shitty, but like, I think that Israel should just drop its borders about where it is now and basically <laughs> palestinians can go live in another place that's that's really shitty but like that's about where i'm at <laughs> uh, with this whole thing or the light green is palestinia wait what light green oh wait i'm sorry i'm looking at the wrong area this is turkey oh here okay Ugh. Now, here's the issue, okay? If he hadn't drawn such serious, such serious damning conclusions before learning about the issue, okay, then this wouldn't be as big as a problem. I have no problem with people that are not knowledgeable on the matter, okay? As long as they're willing to learn. Maybe next time, he won't be so careless as to place himself into a conversation amongst adults when he is very obviously out of his element. It is so odd. Of course his own 
Chad is laughing at him. That's the problem. He literally got owned by Candace Owens this past week. I don't, I haven't watched that and I will not watch that. I don't really hand any, any W's to Candace Owens. Like, I don't written Mr. Record, Pop Mr. Historian, Pharrell. you can't even read the written records. Yeah. I don't know why you're referring Excuse to it. Excuse okay? me. There's, I just said there's... there are 15,000 pages on Annapolis. And I'm sure you cherry quicked your favorite quote from all of them. Pick. Okay. That's hey, great. Least... That... Dude. Accusing Norm Finkelstein of cherry picking his favorite quotes is so funny when you're cherry picking Wikipedia summarizations. Like, what the? F there is a reason why there's a massive intellectual gap between you and him and Rabani and Benny Morris as well. It's because you are completely out of your element. You're trying to, f you're a kindergartner trying to play basketball with LeBron James. And as like LeBron James is dunking on you, you keep going, well, <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm still winning. As long as I maintain this facade, maybe my own fan base won't recognize how humiliated I look to, like, the average onlooker. That's Mr. great. Burrell, at yeah. least I had a quote to check. That's great. Twinkle all you Steve. have and is I can, Wikipedia. Do you want me, I gave oh, you quotes. All you I have is <laughs> even fucking Benny's laughing at him. What, do you want quotes? Get, find me the information I, I that shows think, the Palestinian th cause has been furthered by any international law. You can't do it. I think the Yeah, he keeps going, the Palestinian cause has never been furthered by international law. Okay, what is that? If that if not just like a complete dismantling of international law, in which case it's bedlam, in which case it's might is right. If your politics is reduced to might is uh, might is right. Problem is 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 different. Okay, you you want to you just ruin the critical skills of ten thousand young teenagers by calling citations cherry picking. Yeah, ridiculous. To um, say the you may be too young to sit at the adult table, but you still aren't sitting at the kids table. It's pretty. That's a pretty good own, my friend. I know my limitations. I, if presented the opportunity to sit alongside Norm Finkelstein on a, a subject matter this dense would probably have, I know I would have the decency to say, I think there should be a Rashid Khalidi or, or Rabani who takes this place because they are significantly more knowledgeable on the matter. After all, everything I'm saying, I've learned from them. That's the difference because I don't, I do actually care about the issue. And I want the issue to be presented as best as possible by knowledgeable people who can clearly communicate the historic record because I'm not in it just for the drama of it all. And I don't think a lot of people get that. I'm, I'm telling you right now, like I genuinely don't believe a lot of people understand that this isn't just like some charlatan back and forth. Uh, this is not like a, a, a show. There are very real human beings dying every day okay yeah i'll go on piers morgan i'll go on bbc but if we're talking about like presenting someone like myself as like the foremost authority especially in front of someone like benny morris who at least is a reputable academic regardless of the fact that there are inconsistencies in what his output is and what his actual research suggests right like i, I don't think that it is appropriate for someone like myself to sit there and here is why you're seeing it. This is what happens when you are deluded into thinking that you are actually presenting good arguments on the Israeli side. You've just deluded yourself through Dunning-Kruger and a, and a massive, uh, well, not really massive, but a, a relatively decent but very passionate fan base of sycophants propping you up as this like intellectual giant Especially after you've owned like really dumb people in the red pill side of the world, which those guys are really f stupid. You know what I mean? That's not like, yeah, you can own those guys who are presenting arguments such as you should be able to beat up your wife. Of course, you're going to look like a f lion in front of those guys. But if you're talking about like actual f professors, academics, well-read people, people who are legitimately invested in this, people who have spent their entire lives writing the fucking books that end up in your Wikipedia summaries, you know what I mean? It's ridiculous. You're completely out of your element. You, you Like, please, have some common sense or at least a shred of decency to know when you are not supposed to be there. Yeah, debate Duncan on Trainwreck's podcast is a bit different than this. Exactly. He looked like a line against you, to be fair. Yeah, you would only think that if you are, again, motivated entirely by shapes and colors and not the actual, not the actual analysis, not the actual facts. And unfortunately, Destiny's audience has basically shown that time and time again, time and time again. 
he didn't he had a bunch of people on his stream before not just mark lamont hill that have that have shown clearly that he is wrong on facts that he is presenting and yet his his audience will be like well why didn't you bring that up during the debate it's like why are you so openly saying you don't give a fuck about the truth and you simply care about the aesthetics of that debate in that very moment if you truly believe that debates are where truth comes out then why do you bastardize that principle every step of the way yeah beating john tron not the intellectual mountain the palestinians were only fighting and then when i point out they've also gone to the court and the u.n say well all they do then is these things and you say they should be negotiating and i demonstrate that there was a lengthy um uh, record of negotiations said, yeah, but they didn't go in good faith. Again, you're you got a chroma cloud by debating Shapiro. He didn't though. That's the other part. I legitimately, I legitimately thought that he would do a better job. Okay. Of debating Ben Shapiro. I thought he would have the decency to literally present good arguments and best Ben Shapiro. That is how he has presented himself this whole time. He's this like progressive champion. He just sat there and agreed. While Ben also still bitched him out because the reality is Ben does have more experience. Ben does have more experience. They're both devoid of facts. They're both simply orators, but Ben has more experience in the field of just being wormy. Placing the hamster in the wheel and telling him if he runs fast enough, maybe one day he'll get out of the cage. What was the best good okay, faith please, negotiations if I, if on the I, side of could... He disagreed with Ben on almost anything because he wasn't screaming doesn't mean he won. Wait, what are you talking about? Ben bitched him out on Israel and and he did agree with Ben on Israel almost completely to a T D fans are not even because this is because in his debate D doesn't even do anything that D and D is just coping on Twitter with points he didn't bring up in the debate just finish okay. I I think the fundamental problem here is not what the Palestinians have and haven't done and it's perfectly legitimate to have a discussion about whether they could have been more effective of course, they could have been more effective. Everyone could have all, always been more effective. The fundamental issue here is that Israel has never been prepared to concede the legitimacy of Palestinian national rights in the land of the former British That's mandate of Palestine. Then what, how do you explain Taba Summit? How do you explain the no, Camp Barak David? And Olmer did. How do you explain Olbert's the legitimacy offer to Abbas? Yeah. of Palestinian demands? They, they, this is, well, but they just not, didn't want to give the Palestinians it, 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 it all of Palestine. Mean, that's all. Uh, no, all of Palestine. All of Palestine. You mean all no, of the occupied no, territories? No. You're talking about all of Palestine. Well, wait, the what, is the occupied, no, what is the occupied territories? Tomorrow. The occupied territories. Is that all of Israel? The Professor occupied Martin territories are me. those territories that Israel occupied in June of 1967. You, Palestinians often use that me, term to define okay. the whole of Palestine, could you show me, not just the West Bank. Could you yes, show those, me, Professor Morris, in all the negotiations, all the negotiations and all the accounts that have been written, can you show me one where the Palestinians in the negotiations, because that's what we were talking about, wanted all of Israel the maximum they I can't say that because international oh, so community you know it, won't accept you know it. it. So they you know didn't say it. They didn't know, ask so you for know it. No, the, the Hamas heart. did. Yeah. The Hamas always said Hamas never, all of it. Hamas only negotiated with Israel about prisoner exchanges. Yeah, no, I know. But, so but we they were talking about we were a lot talking of the Palestinian the people. You will agree. The only place I saw pieces of Israel were the land swaps, and the land swaps accounted for about two to five percent of Israel. Nobody asked for all of Israel. Why what do you, do you mean? They asked like for all of Israel in 48. They asked uh, for all of Israel in 67. Okay, what do you Mr. think those Brunel, wars were about? You You're not so, going to respond to anything so, I'm saying because you have no I'll answer. I'll respond to you. That's correct. Okay, okay no. Mr. Bunnell, we were talking about the diplomatic negotiations beginning with 20, 2000, yes, 2001. Saying, you can't pretend that he the first back, ask for Israel went, was in diplomacy. Okay. It was through war. You don't know what you're talking you, about. It's the international law argument ever going to get the Palestinians closer to state? Is the Israeli state ever going to be dismantled? Do you think that's like realistic coming up well, ever in the next 20 years? Again, I'm, I'm posing a question. Um, and the question is, regardless of, of, of what's feasible or realistic today, um, the question I'm posing is, can you have peace in the Middle East with this militant, irrational, genocidal, apartheid, state and I, power. Hamas? I don't think so, no. Okay. And the question I'm asking is, 
can you have peace with this regime or does this regime and its institutions need to be dismantled similar to what the examples I gave of, yeah. of, of Europe and Southern Africa. How do you contend with the fact that most of the surrounding Arab states seem to agree that you can? Yeah, you're correct. Um, several of them, most importantly, Egypt, uh, Jordan have made their peace um, uh, with Israel. I should add that Israel's conduct since then has placed these uh, relations under strain. I, I had very little, um, uh, I didn't take uh, the reports of a Saudi-Israeli rapprochement particularly seriously before October 7th, the reason being that it was really a Saudi-Israeli-US deal, which committed the US um, to make certain commitments to Saudi Arabia that would probably never get through um, Congress. Do you not consider the Egypt-Israeli peace deal legitimate then, since, is, uh, since the United States made a great financial contribution to Egypt? I, I don't think the question is whether that deal is um, uh, legitimate or not. I think, I think that deal um, uh, exists. But the point is um, whether, you know, the, 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 the core of this conflict is not between Israel and Egypt. The core of this conflict is between Israel and the Palestinian people. And the reason that Israel agreed to relinquish um, the occupied Egyptian Sinai, and the reason that Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty was signed in 1979 is because Israel in 1973 Wreck genocide of the Palestinians strikingly similar to the genocide of the Native Americans, but I guarantee you these opinions on two are pretty different. No, I think he, no, dude, I think he would, I suspect that he was, he would probably uh, defend that too. I, I, he, he, he's a genocide writer. Recognized that its military superi superiority was ultimately no match for Egypt's determination to recover its occupied territories and that there would come a point when Egypt would find a way to extract an unbearable Maybe price. Maybe just the Israelis wanted peace. Well, okay. the Israelis Not wanted, just because they were afraid I'm, of I'm, what Egypt might do at some if point. If you're talking about the average Israeli citizen, I, th I think that's a fair characterization. If you're talking about the Israeli leadership, that's I think fine. they looked at it in more strategic terms. I, I, how I, I, do you I, I remove the both. most okay. powerful two point, Arab military states Two points, states simple points. What was the terms of that Egypt-Israel peace treaty? International law. Egypt demanded every... Nobody cared about it. Every, uh, allow me to finish. <laughs> I'm just right. When you got a standing military, at least like, Israel will listen to you a little bit. Every single inch Nobody of Egyptian... Nobody talked about international okay. law. Uh, Begin uh, and professor, Carter uh, and Sadat uh, talked okay. about the reality no, of Israel occupying territory. Professor Morris, Professor Morris, I know the record. They demanded... As you know, because you've written about it, they demanded every square inch. As you know, they demanded the oil fields be dismantled. No, that's that's in the, the air fields. No, not be dismantled. dismantled. They wanted the oil fields. And field. they wanted the settlements dismantled. They that was the settlements the, dismantled. The settlements, the oil fields, and the airfield. They demanded all three back. You can't have. What do you mean back? The airfields weren't there when the Egyptians oh, okay. were there. Okay, that's incorrect. What's, what's You're incorrect. They built, built an airfield. The Israelis built an airfield in the occupied Sinai, yes. and they wanted it back. They, they didn't uh, want it back. It wasn't theirs. No, okay. Uh, they wanted the territory okay. in which the airfield uh, okay. Israel well, had built. Okay. Back. The oil fields, the airfields, the settlements had to be dismantled. Yes. Begin said, I don't want to be the first prime minister to dismantle a uh, settlement. Then but he, he did. did. Why? Because of the law. No, no. it was because of peace. Okay. It was normalization of the law. The law had nothing to do uh, with anything. Uh, it was a negotiation. Okay, this argument does literally reduce to what I'm saying, which is the only time Israel ever listens to anyone, even a little bit, is if there is a standing military backing them. So, okay, I guess it's time for American troops to be put inside of Tel Aviv? Like, what are we doing? You come across as, like, completely unhinged. Like, no peace process will ever work unless American troops forcibly make Israel concede. Is that is that what we're doing? Hassan is the one suggesting troops in Israel. It is, I'm following the logical conclusion of the argument that they're presenting. If might is right is the only time Israel actually concedes the demands being made by other belligerents, belligerents on the other side, if that's the only time they'll concede and international law is completely meaningless, because it doesn't have like military backing, then I guess the only way to stop Israel's genocide 
is by putting military action in display. He's saying the only time Israel ever reckons with other nation states or, or any other entity is when there's force. Mr. Morris, two Mr. states, Mr. Morris, each of which wanted certain the Palestinians things. Palestinians wanted, the law had nothing to do with anything. As I said repeatedly in the you're negotiations. Not you're not listening. I you're, know. You're missing the I've point. I've read the negotiations. The law there has two, nothing to do with anything. There are two foreign relations of U.S. Volumes on nobody cares they, about the law. The Palestinians kept saying we want Forget exactly. The they weren't there. Uh, allow me to finish. The Palestinians kept saying we want what Egypt got. We want what Egypt got. Yeah. Egypt got everything but back. Nothing to do with the law. Okay. Nothing to do. With and the number law. two, I'm not saying it's the whole picture, but as Foreign Minister Moshe Dayan said at the time, he said. If a car has four wheels and you remove one wheel, the car can't move. And for them, removing Egypt from the Arab front would then remove any Arab military yeah, yeah, threat can, to Israel. Yeah, so Moeen, Moeen was, no, the first part did. And that's what the Palestinians kept saying. We want what that, that... Egypt got. Yeah, 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 settlement. that's true, but forget international law. And by the way, nothing to do one with last the, the, the thing, one last, on a personal note, the quote about Sharm el Sheikh without peace. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the only thing you ever cited from a book of mine. You I cited from your book? Yes. I was absolutely shocked <laughs> at your betrayal of your people. That was pure <laughs> treason. I, I, it was I one, apologize for that. One, yes. I apologize. Okay, I, I accept. Apologize. I accept. <laughs> All right. Well, let me try once. I really do think that, regardless of the fact that Benny is also uh, consistently saying, who gives a fuck about international law? Forget about international law, which I think for the average person listening in is probably going to raise some alarm bells or maybe call into question who has the moral high ground here. If there was a, a second person backing Benny that was like a little bit better read, this could have been an even more productive conversation. Once again, uh, for the region and for just the entirety of humanity, what gives you hope? We just heard a lot of pessimistic, cynical takes. What gives People you hope? don't like war. That's, that's a good reason. That's hope. In other words, the fear of war, the disaster of war, should give people an a impetus to try and seek peace. When you look at people in Gaza, and people in the West Bank, people in Israel, they should want fundamentally no, but fundamentally they hate war. Yes, I think so. What what gives you hope? There is no hope now. It's an extreme. No, I'm. Hey, I'm not happy to say that. Of course you are. It's a. It's a very bleak moment right now because that I agree with. I agree with Israel that. believes it has to restore what it calls its uh, deterrence capability. I think you've written about it. Actually, I re just realized Israel has to restore its deterrence cap capability. And after the catastrophe of October 7th, restoring its deterrence capacity means this part you didn't write about the annihilation of Gaza, and then moving on to the Hezbollah. No, no, no. So, so the Israelis are dead set on restoring that deterrence capability. On the Arab side, and I know Moeen and I have disagreed on it, and we're allowed to disagree. Um, I think the Arab side, the lesson they learned from October 7th is Israelis aren't as strong as we thought they were. And that will be an unfortunate, and, and they, unfortunate and they, message and they, if that's really what the yeah, Arabs and they come think, to believe. And they think that there is a military option now. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's, that's it's nasty. a zero sum game at this point. And it's very, very bleak. And I'm not going to lie about that. Now, I will admit my predictive capacities are, are not perfect, are, are limited. limited. Yes, yes. But for the moment, it's a very bleak situation. That I agree with. And I don't see right now a way out. This right here, what Norm is talking about, is the most, Im the most important part of the conversation. He's absolutely correct. Here's why. If you have followed the peace process, or if you're even a little bit knowledgeable over the peace process, you recognize that one of the most important lessons that the Palestinian population learned through experiencing it was that peace negotiations with Israel that came with a shit ton of concessions led 
two more settlements in the West Bank and more brutal military occupation. And in that same time frame, a militancy. Ethan said this and y'all ate him alive? No, it has nothing to do with Ethan at all. Oh God, I would love to hear Ethan and, and Norm talk. I, that would never happen, but one very important lesson was learned when Israel had to leave Lebanon simultaneously. All the peace process was leaving nothing on the table for the Palestinians to hold on to. And that was that a successful military counter like the one posed by Hezbollah in Lebanon, by other coalition forces, but specifically Hezbollah in Lebanon, actually produced tangible positive results for the Lebanese people. That is directly responsible for Hamas legitimizing its position straight up. That was the day that Hamas was able to, in my opinion, calcify its existence. If you look at Hamas's rise in popularity over the years and even the evolution of tactics, the evolution of tactics that Hamas adopted and there are many issues along the way like in my opinion switching from only military targets to actually Israeli civilians was a major tactical error in my opinion this came after the the uh the assassinations well not the assassinations the the, the mass shooting in the mosque it was Al-Aqsa mosque that was when Hamas openly declared that Israeli civilians would also suffer penalties. That was a major error, in my opinion. Perhaps maybe an error that caused there, uh, the Hebron one, uh, I think it was, uh, no, it wasn't, you're right, it wasn't uh, Al-Aqsa. I think, yes, the Baruch Goldstein massacre. I think that that was a major error and actually probably caused Hamas to not gain prominence and popularity for many years to come. And then, in my opinion, in my opinion, the, the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon showed the Palestinian population that there is no way to make concessions with Israel that does not only lead to further death and destruction for the Palestinians. This is why I always say Israel is primarily responsible for the existence of Hamas. And it was very self-serving. It was another tactical error from the Israeli front. Benjamin Netanyahu is on the record saying that Hamas, because they are viewed as terrorists from the rest of the world, to the rest of the world, to the Western world, they are much easier to deal with because Israel can always control how high the flames go. Not realizing that that arrogance, that incompetence and that arrogance, that hubris that you can only have if you start believing your own propaganda about how Palestinians are subhuman, okay, and barbaric and, and can't get their shit in order. Only then do you legitimately arrive at a situation like October 7. You don't take the necessary security precautions. You reshift your interest and your forces uh, into the West Bank to further the oppression of the Palestinians in the West Bank because you want to satiate the, the bloodlust that uh, Itamar ben Gvir has. Right? You do all of that, you get very complacent, you start believing that, no, you can actually have an apartheid without incurring any cost to your population. I think Israel showed throughout that peace process, it needs violent resistance to come to the table. This was a horrible, horrible mistake. Obviously, Benjamin Netanyahu is not single-handedly responsible for this. But he certainly was a champion of it for many decades. However, at the very minimum, permanent ceasefire and the inhuman and illegal blockade of Gaza. And uh, why is free, it illegal? The they were shooting rockets at Israel for, for 20 years. Okay, I, I, why is that illegal I, I to blockade I, Gaza? He thinks why, they're bottle rockets. Why, 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 why is it times. illegal? I'll tell you why. You don't rocket okay, your neighbor. You I'll rocket your neighbor. You, I'll, expect I'll consequences. I'll tell you why. Expect consequences. Then, uh, but that works both ways. Yes. I know, no, I expect that. Professor, both, Mar Professor works Morris, both ways. I'll tell you why. Yo, that's crazy. He's saying, <laughs> dude, Benny Morris is a really interesting guy because he literally is like, he's doing realpolitik with a terror cell that he believes is a terror cell. He's literally saying that, like, the Palestinian enterprise is comprised of, like, an eclectic band of, of marauders, his words, okay? And, like, it is a permanent 
situation of fuck around and find out, like back and forth, and Israel is the one who's always showing might is right to the Palestinians. I don't think he would have this callous of an indifference to Palestinian actions if Palestinians had equal proportional uh, standing militaries, or not even proportional standing militaries, but like better arms, as a matter of fact. Every single thing he's mentioned so far leads me to believe that his conclusion is that like Israel only gets to do this stuff because they have a stronger military. I, I've never been more reaffirmed in my position that like our endless political cover for the genocidal state of Israel is profoundly impactful and gives Israel all of the f go ahead to operate in the violent ways that it has. Because every human rights humanitarian and UN organization in the world irrelevant. has said, You're has said you that the blockade them. Nobody cares is, a about form an of, is a form of collective punishment, Nobody cares which about is amnesty. illegal under international Forget law. Illegal. The word you, illegal think, is... <laughs> you think a blockade. You which, don't understand okay. the way the world works. Yeah. And, the, these and things are think, irrelevant. And you think confining. Because that's the blockade. Yes, you don't Confining shoot your... There is no opposing force, so how are you wrong? Egypt was the example you needed? No, that's... He already gave that example himself. He's basically saying that as long as there's like a real standing military that presents a threat to Israel, that Israel will actually uh, engage in realpolitik and uh, engage in a process of peace negotiations. Lebanon is another example of this with Hezbollah. Israel is basically a permanent destabilizing factor in the region that actually doesn't correspond to American state interests, in my opinion, if this is the attitude that they have. Everybody knows international law is a joke, but like you at least have to present the argument from the framework of international law. That's precisely the reason why they talk about human shields. Like, why the f would you talk about human shields if uh, international law doesn't matter and it's might is right. Obviously, might is right is the primary framework that he's operating off of, but he still tries to present an argument towards international law. That's why he has to justify the Israeli atrocities in an effort to say it's not a genocide. That's why he talked about the International Court of Justice and the decision and even lied and made it seem like the International Court of Justice decision actually wasn't uh, uh, damning so far for there to be at least like uh enough evidence that israel is uh demonstrating genocidal intent for the court case to continue uh, like he did if he didn't give a shit about international law he would just say suck my dick to the icj decision to continue the case but obviously he does care i'm talking about benny morris now benny morris does care about international law he cares about international law as far as the western world cares about international law finding a million children combining that's the choice combining, of hamas. combining that's hamas a million choice. children in what the economist called okay. a human rubbish the, sheep. The economist supported he, Israel in this war yeah. and continues okay. to support Israel. What um, International Committee of the Red Cross called a sinking ship, what the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights called a toxic slum. You think it is a slum, yeah, of course. You, it's you, slum. you think but it's caused by under the international Hamas. law, you think it's legitimate Forget to the law. Hey. I know you want to forget the law. What about it's the morality? one thing that forget every is, what about it's what every Israeli fears the most. What? The law. No, as no, as no. Sippy literally <laughs> said, I. Oh, good. Good God. Holy moly. Studied international law. I oppose international law. Of course, you don't want to hear about the law. Then it's got nothing so, to do hey, with anything. Okay, so here's the thing. Yeah. Then don't complain about October 7th. If you don't want to, if you want to say, forget about the law. All I said was they then, acted like barbarians. Then there is no Yo, that's kind of wild. Benny Morris is crazy, bro. He's literally just like, yeah, I don't give a f dog. <laughs> Israel got what it was coming. <laughs> He's literally just, his, his indifference to the, to the atrocities is crazy. Now he has no, atro uh, now he is uh, demonstrating indifference at least. But like before he was like. International humanitarian law. There's no distinction between civilians and combatants. There, there should be. And so, how be, no, now law. you're doing what Moeen said. You're becoming very selective about the law. If you want to forget... Oh, thank God they're actually doing what I was just saying. Um, yeah, he, they're, they're parsing through his picking and choosing of international law. Because if you truly didn't care about international law and you completely abandoned it and said that there's no basis for international law and that was like a, a foundational principle that you have in this conversation, you would never bring up the human shields argument at all. You would simply say, 
Israel is destroying Palestine because it can, which is the truth, by the way. You wouldn't have to say like, oh, there's human shields and Hamas is hiding between the babies and that's why we have to kill the babies. You can't only apply international law when you see fit, even as a justification for Israel's genocidal actions or when you're talking about Hamas's actions. And about the law, Hamas had People every right to do what board. it did. It had every right to do what it did, according to you, not to me, because you want to forget the law. Do you still support the Houthis shooting random ships? Absolutely. Okay, that's a violation of international Absol law, so you play the Absolutely. same game. Absolutely. And were there a power during World War II who had the courage of the Houthis? Were there a power that had that kind so of courage? So courageous to, to be bombing yeah. merchant ships while oh, tens of thousands oh, of people yeah. died of actual starvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. the starvation that exists in the oh, Gaza Strip yeah, okay. where people- He said actual starvation and not the starvation that exists in the Gaza Strip. And he threw up the air quotes. Dude, dude, what a immoral charlatan. Thank God Norm handed him his, Norm just destroyed him. It is un, I, it gives me a little bit of solace to know he's flailing around, angrily pacing his apartment, thinking about how hard he got bitch slapped. Okay. Intellectually bested because God damn, these are such incredibly inhumane things to say this is like this is straight nazi bullshit during the holocaust like nazi propagandist bullshit in air quotes the fake famine in gaza wow before October, oh, don't I, die of starvation what not, about that, star not the concentration camp of the gaza what about, camp. Star Houthis, what about starvation in yemen uh, don't they have something hey, better to do that was the houthis yes i know don't that they was have the don't they have anything and you better know, to in do three years they shouldn't lost they be 180 000 people? shouldn't they be yeah the starvation in yemen caused by saudi arabia with american weapons what do you mean what about the Houthis. The entirety of Yemen is united on the Palestinian cause because they recognize that the genocide that they withstood from the Saudi and UAE coalition forces with American weapons is very similar to the genocide that the Palestinians are experiencing currently. That is wild. The people of Yemen have shown that they are united. Those who literally fought against the Houthis are now united in arms against Israel. That much they have openly stated. Why would you even talk about this? What the Houthis are trying to do in the Red Sea is unironically what America should be doing. Obviously, when America implements a blockade, they don't need to resort to direct physical contact with any of the merchant vessels because no merchant vessel will ever pass through. America, however, only has that smoke for countries that don't deserve it. Countries that justifiably had their own revolutions like in Cuba, a country where apparently, according to Destiny's mother, uh, his family owned slaves in, in their plantation. Those are not my words. That's Destiny's mother on stream saying that. I don't know if it's real. It came across like a joke to me. I'll be honest with you because why was she so callous when talking about her slaves, but her family's slaves. But yeah, America only has uh, embargo smoke for countries like Cuba for the crime of having a revolution against the dictatorship, the violent dictatorship of Batista that was aligned with our interests. Somebody wants to know which part of Cuba we came from. My grandfather's sugar plantation. Yeah, with, this, with the... <laughs> <laughs> I know we where we lived in Cuba, you would have enjoyed because um, we lived, at least the last period of time that I remember, we lived on my grandfather's sugarcane plantation. Yeah. Yeah. I remember going out with a, I don't know if it's called a sickle, something or other, that you went, mm -hmm. and I was, I left there at five years in one day, so that had to be when I was four. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think, he, I, I, I hope that it's not real. Still a weird thing to joke about, but if it is a joke at all, that structure, that order of slavery was overthrown in the Cuban revolution and America punished Cuba for it by implementing an embargo, a blockade that it maintains to this day. Cuba has thrived in spite of said inhumane actions by the most powerful imperialist nation on the planet. Thrived Lamau, all things considered, yes, especially in comparison. When you're talking about a country that has been able to create a vaccine for lung cancer in spite of that embargo that I was talking about 
especially when compared to all of the other surrounding nations. Yeah, they're doing fairly well, all things considered. Um, this episode of The Straw Man brought to you by McDonald's, this twist, the twist is that it isn't a debate if you subscribe to this brain rot, you're essentially reminding everyone that you're still brain dead. Anyway, the point is, the reason why I brought up the Cuban embargo is because... The reason why I brought up the Cuban embargo is because America implements embargoes on countries, okay? Blockades on countries. That's what Yemen is trying to do with the limited tools at their disposal. If America actually was a follower of international rules and laws, there would be no need for anyone in Yemen to do such a thing. America would be doing it. Well, first, America would be restricting arms trades to Israel for its continued genocidal campaign. And if it didn't stop, then that would follow feeding the you know, 60,000 Yemenis die why fight in starvation is that seriously your claim that they had slaves that she used the word plantation you know you can have a plantation without slaves well why does she do this whipping motion like i thought she was just joking now you're making it now you're making me think that she wasn't joking why did she say i, I went out with the whip and did the whipping motion was that also what does she went out with a sickle oh she was cutting crops in the sugar plantation oh got it it was just one of those plantations devoid of slaves. Got it. Okay. It was the woke DEI plantation. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was the one, it was one of those Batista plantations that didn't have slaves. It was like, yo, chill. For the record, I didn't even think personally that it was like real at all. I thought she was just memeing, you know, maybe, maybe she was just like behaving like uh, Destiny does and joke about like serious shit like that, you know? Why did they have to leave it behind so suddenly? Yeah, I don't, I don't really care about, uh, this aspect of the conversation. I'm gonna be honest with you. That's why I was willing to say, hey man, it's probably a joke, you know what I mean, and move on. Um, I wanna hope that it is. None of that actually has any factor in this conversation that we're currently having about Israel-Palestine. You brought it up, you do care? Yeah, I was making a short quip about America's capabilities of implementing an embargo against our foreign adversaries. A lot of first timers chiming in right now. Anyway. Um, um, much about Cuban history, but weren't slaves outlawed in the 1800s? Kind of dumb and racist to imply they had slaves. No, totally. Um, every single person that's asking that question, I really want to understand what your position is on the, the, uh, Uyghur, uh, concentration camps, work camps. Do you feel like they are classified as slaves or do you think that's a totally separate thing? Because the reality is you can't have one and the other. Uh, Batista was a brutal dictator. And yes, they did have plantations with actual slaves in them, regardless of what country actually abolished slavery at what year. Like, do you, do you, are you, are you taking up, uh, are you assuming a pro Batista answer specifically to, de to defend destiny? Um, this is a very confusing thing. Or did you read the Wikipedia where uh, it said slavery was abolished? So the, the, uh, you know, conditions of the newer kinds of slaves in the forms of uh, indentured servitude was actually. A little bit different. But nine, I was watching this, and I have to say, I have to say, you sold your little short. Do you think you actually belong on that table? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think that these are more knowledgeable people. Why fight the Western powers and Israel when you should be taking care of your problems at home? The Houthis. Often, the only allies of the dispossessed are those who experience similar circumstances. Don't you think that they should take care of the Yemen? Yeah, I literally was joking. I, I mean, I, no, I wasn't joking. Sorry. I, I literally said, I think. To be as charitable as possible, I thought his mom was joking. And those who wanted to defend destiny went to the lengths to literally start justifying slavery and practice in Cuba and also Batista. Very odd behavior. Very, very odd behavior, guys. I don't know what you're doing. You should have just kept it at me being like, oh, it's probably a joke and moved on. That's odd, man. Yemeni yeah, problems. As I'm I very said. happy. It's, I'm very happy they're helping out the Palestinians. Anyone who helps the, the people, the of the uh, anybody, anybody it. who comes to the they're, aid of those suffering the genocide, half no of whom are half there's of no whom are children. Yeah, according to the most current UN reports, as there's of no today, one quarter of the population of Gaza is starving. That means five hundred thousand children <laughs> are starving, are on the verge of famine. They keep saying on the verge of. I have not. I have not seen. I have not seen one Palestinian ago? die of starvation in these last four months. Well, not one. There have They're been always on the verge. Cases. They're yeah. on the verge. There have been documented cases. I haven't of, seen of, them. Yesterday, in, Al Jazeera in, said six, and the day before that, they said two. So those are the, okay. the two. The star, the, that number. How many people need to die of starvation before it's like a, a good number? What's the number? What's the number?
What's the acceptable number of dying children of starvation? Like this is not even a now. Now we are just we're no longer just doing genocide denial. Uh, we're no longer just doing famine denial. You're just like directly denying every f organ of international authority that is openly stating that the situation in Palestine is dire. There are literally there are Holocaust footage style videos of children with their rib cages showing literally one to one comparison at this point. That is insane. This is Nazi level atrocity denial. It's terrifying. In response to this point, Norm, his assistant, posted a picture of a child dying in starvation on his Twitter account. Yeah, I saw that. That's fucking gross, man. That's actually so gross. Number probably dies you're, in Israel of starvation also. So I, I don't think there's famine so in Israel. Back. There isn't. There isn't in the Gaza Strip you're either. So it's back. something so which is they... produced for the Western. There, Western there, there are infants yet. dying due to a engineered lack of access to food and nutrition. I don't think it's engineered. I think if the Hamas stopped shooting, perhaps, or... Unfortunately, well, unfortunately. As you most, said, engineered. I think um, Amnesty, and, excuse me, Human Rights Watch called it using starvation as a weapon. That's called engineering. Okay. That's what they did. But you were pushed on this yeah. by Coleman Hughes to bring yeah. up like an example of why is the Gaza Strip? Like what by what metric are they starving? By what metric is it so behind the rest okay. of the world? You know, if we're going to bring up um, well, I want to hear an answer to that because he didn't answer okay, it. Okay, I'm happy we to kidding. answer it. Yeah. I just quoted you from the humanitarian organizations. They said one quarter of the population of Gaza is now verging on famine. Before October 7th. Okay. Before October 7th. I'm not 7th. going before October That's what, 7th. You use that as justification for Hamas fighting. You say the conditions were unlivable. They yeah, had to I, fight. I said to him. So my question is, I, what made it unlivable prior to October 7th? What are the, what are the okay. metrics? That okay. Here's one metric. Um, Israel literally denied pasta into f***ing Gaza. Pasta. Like the blockade was rigorous. The blockade was incredibly restrictive. The blockade was not just about ensuring that fucking weapons don't go into Gaza, but instead shit like pasta, chocolate. The interior ministry officials at the time called it counting calories, putting the Palestinians on a diet very openly. Israel set a caloric restriction upon the Palestinian population. Not only that, but also, Palestinians don't have drinkable water. Israel controls almost all the water, all the salination plants. Israel basically virtually destroyed. The salination plants that currently exist need power, power that only comes in from Israel, by the way. 90% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable, unusable completely. This is before October 7. Kaya. Most recent list of prohibited, uh, permitted prohibited items in the Gaza Strip. Sage, cardamom, cumin, coriander, ginger, jam, halva. Vinegar, nutmeg, chocolate, fruit preserve, seeds and nuts, biscuits and sweets, potato chips, gas for soft drinks, dried fruit, fresh meat, plaster, tar, wood for construction, cement, iron, glucose, industrial salt, plastic, glass, metal containers. This is from 2010. Yes, 2010, which is before October 7. Are you are you going to make an argument? No, pasta was not permitted and then was allowed for the record. Dude, 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 you guys are doing the same thing that Destiny does all the time, where you think you are arriving at, like, you think you are arriving at an inconsistency here because you don't know. I love you guys. Please don't try to do this. You are currently out of your element. You are literally, you have all of the, you, unlike iPad boy over there, could just simply Google a lot of this stuff so you can come up with a better conclusion and, and know better than to think that this is going to be a way to own me, okay? You don't have to be on the spot in the same way that he is currently being showed up by someone who knows more than he does because you do have, um, you do have personally the internet. You are anonymous. You don't have to immediately write something. You could just like wait and come up with like a better counter. This document is from 2010, but that still doesn't change that reality that this is like pre October 7. Also, yeah, they do have the... It's on Wikipedia too, by the way. So, yeah, it was declared an open uh, air prison long before October 7. Gaza was. It was a Haaretz report from 2009. Sometimes it just seems like Israel is actively trying to destroy its own international image. Haaretz reports. However, an incident occurred last week at a crossing of the Gaza Strip that gave a very different impression to a senior observer. When senior John Kerry visited the Strip, he learned that many trucks loaded with pasta were not permitted in. When the chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee inquired as to the reason for the delay, he, told, he was told by the United Nations aid officials that Israel does not define pasta as a part of humanitarian aid, only rice shipments. Kerry asked Barack about the logic behind this restriction, and only after the senior U.S. officials' intervention did the defense minister allow the pasta into the Strip. Another testament to how much power America has over the conditions in the Gaza Strip that befall upon the Palestinian population, 2 million at the time, 
innocent civilians, men, women, children, doctors, professors, people with hopes, people with dreams, unimaginable cruelty, unimaginable. This is factoid bait, brother. I'm just saying I brought up a factoid, okay? And people didn't believe me, so it's good to, you know, it's good to show you that there is, uh, these facts are, are correct. It's a small, silly, nonsensical fact that plays a role in a sea of much larger, much more severe consequences born out of this small fact than many others like this one. It is totally relevant to the conversation. You cannot cast this aside by saying it's just factoid bait. The reason why I bring this up is because it's a silly one. It makes people go, huh? That can't possibly be true because it's so stupid. It plays a role in invoking emotion. It gives you additional context to the cruelty that Israel, the ritualistic humiliation that Israel subjects Palestinian people to. If you want to fully understand the situation circa October 7, the situation that Palestinians uh, were experiencing, this is one small fact that is interesting enough because it's confusing. It's stupid. Like, why would you do this other than simple cruelty? And also, you're correct on this. I didn't even bring this up. Destiny is deflecting away from October 7 famine, which he cast aside as nonsensical, only to follow up and say, well, what about before October 7? What about the famine then? What about the starvation then? You said it was an open-air prison. You said there was mass starvation, a population on the verge of starvation, moving the goalposts. Now, of course, Israel's cruelty upon the Palestinian population is bountiful, is so plentiful that even when you do deflect, you end up deflecting into another landmine because there's cruelty there too. You would know this if you didn't try to justify Israel's genocidal ambition, completely deny Israel's atrocious war crimes leading up to October 7. If you knew the conditions beyond simple talking points that you are using like a like an NPC video game character with a with a tree of talking points, you would recognize that Israel had destroyed all the working water infrastructure, the working uh, energy infrastructure long before October 7. One must ask how this is not an open air prison if Palestinians can't go six miles out from their own water line without risk of being shot by Israeli Marines. One must ask why Gaza does not have a working airport any longer. It used to, it does not anymore. One must ask how Israel controls, as Yoav Gallant openly admitted, all of the energy and all of the water and all of the food supply that goes into Gaza if it's not simply an open-air prison. One of the grossest things that people actually... Another document showing when certain substances were actually permitted to be imported into Gaza hasn't been updated by the Israeli government since 2010. Yeah. One must also... You make it sound like Israel has a Navy, Air Force, Army, and Palestine has fishermen trying to fish. Yes, Palestinians do have fishermen trying to fish. What the fuck are you talking about? That's what fishermen do. You know what Palestine doesn't have? An active port. Yes, fishing, if you knew anything about the Palestinians, you would know that fishing was a massively important part of the Palestinian economy and Palestinian existence. There's a literal fisher net on the kafia, the symbol of, of struggle, the symbol of emancipation that Palestinians wear. It's literally that important to them. It's almost as important as the other thing that Israel also routinely destroys, the olive tree. I don't understand why so many of you watched Destiny get dog walked by someone who knows infinitely more than he does only to come in here and literally try to argue with me and you know even less than he does. At least he's like studied the talking points. You haven't even done that. You do not know anything. You do not know anything about uh, the Palestinians at all. The history of Palestine, Palestinian existence, you must not consider Palestinians to be human if you think that they have a sea line and they don't do fishing. Like, what? It's, it's shocking to me how uninterested you are to even craft a good argument for why Israel must eviscerate the Palestinian population. You're purely reacting to shapes and colors. It's wild. And the only reason why you can get away with this anti-intellectual way of argumentation is because... There is a big chunk of people who also don't see Arabs across the board as humans, who don't see Muslims as human beings. So you can get away with saying these sorts of things in polite conversation. You can get away with saying these sorts of things in corporate media, but you can't get away with that here. Very, very silly. Silly is what I'll say instead of other things that I do want to say. That you're okay. using. There were about five, six or seven reports issued by UNCTAD 
issued by the World Bank, issued by the International Monetary Fund, and they all said, that's why. That's why. Why did they say why? Okay. Why did they say that's that? That's why the economists. You make it sound like Israel has a Navy, Air Force, Army, and Palestine has fishermen trying to fish. I have read three blog posts on the topic. Okay, they were being sarcastic. I hope they were being sarcastic and in agreement with me. Jesus Christ. Not a radical periodical. Describe Gaza as a human rubbish. So tell me he, by what metrics. If there, you're, if you're hey, a historian, if okay, you do all this work to okay, get things, here, tell me what they said. Tell me, Mr. Mr. Tell, Mr. Me Bunnell, tell me by what Mr. metrics. Bunnell. He's not going to answer again. Uh, I, I don't think I've avoided any of your questions, you except, you except when, they question. breached, when they breached the threshold uh -huh. of complete imbecility. So you're about to tell me I'm by what metric so, the Gaza Strip okay, is a I'm humanitarian going to answer crisis. You. Okay. you remember what I said? It's crazy. He's saying what metrics is Gaza humanitarian crisis is a crazy point. This is not even a... Dude, dude, why do you even justify Israel's actions then if you're just going to deny all of the atrocities? There is no reason to even admit that there is any atrocities to begin with if you're saying that like there's no there is no uh there's no metric of of pain here for the palestinian oppression before october 7 they were living completely fine lives but that's one of the worst parts about this by the way the palestinian resilience is very strong that they have in spite of the conditions that israel has 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 brought upon them they've still thrived under those conditions they still had moments of happiness. There's still, uh, there's still all those old photos of, of Gaza that you see on the timeline when compared to what it looks like now leveled. And the grossest thing the Zionists do is they point to those photos of Gaza and go, see, it's a paradise. Yeah, and it was an even better paradise when they had a working airport. You know what I mean? At a moment ago, I said to Professor Morris, I defer to expertise. I look at what the organizations say. I look at what the United Nations High Commissioner so for say Human Rights said. You don't know. You don't know. I, I or you don't, don't care. Know. Okay, I don't that's know. Fine. Do you know how that. complicated? Have you ever investigated how complicated is the metric for hunger, starvation, and famine? It is such a complicated a metric they figured out. If you asked me to repeat it now, I couldn't do it. And yet we have I a def human development I, I, index I, where we rank countries, yeah, yet okay. we can still measure okay. infant mortality, no life you, expectancy. No the okay. Yeah, we can measure all of these yeah. things. Yeah. Wait, what? Okay, we do measure those things. He is right about that. Norm Finkelstein is using institutions that are literally more reputable than the, the World Economic Forum or the Democracy Index when talking about those reputable institutions mentioning the caloric deficit and how they arrive at the conclusion that the situation in Palestine, the situation in the Gaza Strip was actually dire. How can you be such an institutionalist and have such a hard on for only some of the facts, but when presented the, the exact same facts from, you know, similar institutions about the situation in Gaza, okay? You all of a sudden go, well, what about the, let's dive into it a little bit. Like the human development index, really? That's what, like that is the, the, the position of authority here. But uh, the, the, the institutions that uh, Norm Finkelstein is bringing up are not? Like, I don't understand. Maureen, I'm holding out for you here. You still didn't answer the hope question. What gives you a source of hope about the region? Well, uh, first of all, I would agree with, Benny Morris and, and Norman Finkelstein, um, that the current situation is bleak. And I think it would be um, unreasonable to expect it to not get even bleaker uh, in the coming weeks and months. And we now, this conflict. Also, for the record, the mass starvation as a tactic is post October 7 which was the original point of contention that Norm was bringing up, which he very, he, he just cast aside with air quotes, okay? He said, on the verge of famine, sure, okay? And then immediately reverted it back to pre-October 7. Conflict really, it originated in the late 19th century. It's been, um, been a more or less active conflict since the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and it has produced a tremendous amount of, of, of suffering and, and, and regional conflict and geopolitical complications and all of that. Uh, but what gives me hope is that throughout their entire ordeal, 
um, the Palestinian people have never surrendered. Um, and I believe they never will surrender to overwhelming force and violence. They have taken everything that Israel has thrown at them. They have taken everything that the West has thrown at them. They have taken everything that those who are supposed to be their natural allies have um, uh, on occasion uh, thrown at them. But um, this is a people that never has, and I believe never will surrender. And um, at a certain point, I think um, Israel uh, and its leaders um, will have to come to the realization that by hook or by crook, um, these people are going to achieve their inalienable and legitimate um, uh, national rights. And, and that, that is going to be a reality. I, I, um, as I well, was, what do you mean by that? You mean all of Palestine? Is that what you mean? No. And, and From the river to the sea? Well, ideally, of course, yes. Um, and and what Those I was those inalienable rights. No, what I was saying earlier, and then the discussion got sidetracked, is um, that I did believe that a two-state settlement, um, a partition of Palestine um, along the 1967 uh, boundaries, um, would have been a reasonable um, solution because I think it also would have opened pathways to um, further... But now you believe what? Further nonviolent engagement between us um, along the 1967 uh, oh, boundaries um, would have... I've been watching the video for so long, it even fucking reset, let alone at the top of the hour when there's a three-minute ad break, too. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime, by the way. Here's the three-minute ad break now been a reasonable um, solution because I think it also would have opened pathways to um, further... But now you believe what? Further nonviolent engagement between Israel and the Palestinians that could create um, other forms of coexistence in a, in a federal or binational or, or What do you other... think about refugees in regards to that? Do you think there has to be a resettlement of the five or six million, whoever wants to lay like, claim to be I descendants think, I, of... I think, I think there has to be an explicit acknowledgement um, of, uh, of, of, of the responsibility and... And the return. And of their rights. I think that in the framework of a two-state settlement, I think a formula would need to be found that does not undermine um, uh, the foundations um, uh, of a two-state settlement. And I don't think it would be that difficult because I suspect that there are probably large numbers of um, Palestinian refugees who, once their rights are acknowledged, will find it um, exceptionally so, distasteful, so Canada, Canada. Uh, exceptionally distasteful um, to have to live among the kind of sentiments that we've heard around this table um, today, to be quite frank. I mean, I heard, I, you know, I'm, I was previously unfamiliar with you, um, and I watched one of your preparation videos. Uh, very disconcerting stuff, I have to say. You were explaining <laughs> two days ago in the discussion about apartheid and how absurd it was that in your view, Jim Crow was not apartheid. Jim Crow was not apartheid. But Arab states not giving citizenship to Palestinian refugees is apartheid. My oh my God. It's so... God, his, his analysis, his depravity knows no bounds, okay? It literally only works if you just think, if you're foundational principle here is that like no one else can do any wrong white people on top only arabs bad it's f nuts jesus christ dude that's position. what i meant sure. with my, my earlier position. comments that's about fine. That's white great. supremacy so my issue that's great the white supremacy comment and if i, so I, I, my, I well, well hold on well, let me let me respond okay my issue is that i feel like we have jumped on this euphemistic trip progressive by the way straight up red mill and i think that's part of the reason why this conflict will never get solved is because on one end you've got a people who are now convinced internationally that they're victims of apartheid genocide constant they're not convinced internationally they're experiencing it all you are doing is genocide denial one day i hope that we will look back at this and shudder and and, and 
and we will have a hard time comprehending the inhumanity of the statements that this asshole is making. This is insane. This is just straight up moral bankruptcy. And let me tell you, okay, here, one thing I will tell you is this. Destiny gets his talking points or tries to position his moral compass around the Democratic Party, right? Sometimes he'll, you know, take a more right-wing position on issues. Maybe sometimes takes a more left-wing position. Not entirely sure when he's done that recently. I don't really pay attention to much of what he says, except for the fact that I've just listened to this asshole, forced to listen to this asshole for five hours. What he doesn't know because of his inexperience dealing with this, what he doesn't understand is that the Democratic Party's position is going to inevitably have to evolve on the matter, and he's going to look like a indecent charlatan, okay? Let me tell you something. Chuck Schumer today said Benjamin Netanyahu is bad, and what he's doing is bad. What he doesn't know is that this stuff, there's a reason why many Democratic Party leaders, no matter how loyal they are to Israel, don't go to these lengths that he's going to, because... They're calculated political actors with many years. They know what they know what it looks like when your statements are posterized in perpetuity. Because of his inexperience in this field, he has positioned himself way, way outside of the scope of what Democrats would be comfortable saying not realizing that these statements will haunt him, okay? And I'm talking about it strictly on griftonomics terms, okay? Because I do not think that a human being can be this depraved. He thinks he's dick riding Israel to this degree, and it will suit his purpose in the short term, not realizing that this is, this is now a part of history, a part of his history, so when the Democratic Party inevitably, the Democratic Party inevitably shifts positions on Israel and says things like, oh my God, you know, maybe we went a little too far and it's actually all Benjamin Netanyahu's fault. He's going to be left in the fucking dark. He's going to be left out uh, outside of the boundaries of, you know, moral permissibility. He already is. Because he is defending ethnic cleansing. He's betting on the country's right-wing turn. He said there was going to be a backlash to leftist progressivism for years. Oh, people are that depraved. 40% of Israelis want more genocide. Yeah, it doesn't matter. He's not living in Israel, okay? He's living in fucking America. Unless he does like a full-blown, full-tilt, uh, right-wing, uh, open fascist grift, these statements will haunt him. I mean, even if he does that, these statements will haunt him in perpetuity. It's crazy. He's so horny to defend Israel on like certain conditions that he keeps saying things like fake famine. You only do this if you're inexperienced, okay? That's why you don't hear this level of, of animosity, this level of like openly stating that, that uh, like things that you can see with your own two eyes actually are not real. They're surreal. They're made up by some grand narrative. Not if he's completely shameless, and he is. No, no. He is a bad person. It's not about what the Democratic Party says. It's about what drives engagement. You give him too much credit, he's morally and ideologically bankrupt. The mistake he made is he looked at Israelis, and now he's using the rhetoric of an Israeli and not an American Hosburist. Yeah. No, I think so. I, I, I think so, too. Why is everyone here so biased? Bro, come on. We're biased against genocide. Like, what the f do you mean? Yeah, why won't we see the position like the carefully documented malnutrition that the Palestinian children are currently experiencing, why don't we just deny that? Like, that's your question here, okay? Like, why don't we deny what we see with our own two eyes? Why don't we deny what, like, every fucking liberal media network is basically presenting now? Very different than what they were saying on October 7. What you have to realize, what you have to realize is... This has been happening since October 7. A lot of people came in here and were like, oh, Hassan, you are going to get your comeuppance. Like, you are going to be proven wrong over and over again. And some people just simply never checked in ever again. They checked out. They never checked in ever again to see if, like, I was right. But the reason why I've been vindicated time and time again, and this is a really weird thing to say, considering that my vindication comes at the price of Palestinian deaths, is because I am familiar with with the ways in which Israel has operated for years. Many of you, on the other hand, 
have only hyper focused on this conflict and learned about stuff and are you're playing catch up you're playing catch up in the last quarter not knowing what the next steps are going to look like because you don't know it's it, and it's understandable that you don't know so the point is the point is if you don't know then the least you can do is just maybe try to learn Concentration camp conditions, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, they're forced to live in an open air prison um, with all of these things that are stacked against them. All of these terms that are highly specific, that refer to, to very precise things. Uh, and then when people well, like you said that they should- I nothing less from someone who doesn't think Jim Crow is apartheid. I don't know if Jim- But who does think of that Arab states The problem is you're morally housing. loading. For you, apartheid is when racists do bad things. No, right? no. There's the, the, a, there's the a specific, definition of apartheid. That's, that's great. But there's the, a very the clear specific, No, there is a- What the- what dude 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 you can't do this you're not talking to some limp dick pua red pill podcaster okay like when you're talking to a serious journalist or a serious academic you can't put words in their mouth and be like uh -huh, you just think apartheid is when racists do bad things no they don't think that there's a very clear legal definition of what it is and the people that came up with that very clear legal definition also think it, fit, it fits the bill of Israel. Top-down racial domination enacted through top-down, like, federal legislative policies or whatever means that I don't know if, um, I don't know if Jim Crow would have qualified for apartheid. That doesn't make it any less, Ferguson? excuse me, Finkelstein, I'm talking right now. Ferguson? Excuse me, excuse me, Twinkelstein, I'm talking to your friend over here. Um, I don't know if it would have qualified as the crime of apartheid. Just like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of In genocide. In your eyes, probably not. I don't, well, mm. yeah, but because genocide requires a special intent. I think the issue yeah. is, and, 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 and Teta- Yeah, and, and for the record, that legal standard, according to the International Court of Justice, has been met to at least prosecute it, which is a pretty high bar to clear. It is not, this is not something that people just dish out willy nilly, okay? Uh, instead of, and I think this conversation is actually is emblematic of the entire conversation. I don't Good, think anything- Let me finish I think, answering. Well, sure. Did I just, wait. To literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of in genocide. In your eyes, like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of in genocide. In your eyes, probably. Like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of in genocide. In your eyes, probably not. I don't. I'm sorry. What? To your friend over here, um, I don't know if it would have qualified as the crime of apartheid. Just like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of in genocide. In your eyes, probably. Come on, there's enough dick riders in here still watching, hate watching. Explain it. I explain it. Like, what is he saying? Is he saying that, like, like genocide only happens if it's, like, through uh, the mechanism of ovens? Like, what the, uh, the The Yemen, the genocide in Yemen, not a real genocide. The genocide, the genocide in Yemen, not a real genocide. The, the, uh, the genocide of the Yazidi population, not a real genocide. Only 5,000. Who cares? ISIS on top. Like, is that what he's saying? Like, I don't get it. The Armenian genocide, not a real genocide. Is that his position here? That is an insane f approach. Like, what? Yeah, Rwanda, not real. None of these genocides are real because, you know, it it's about, it's about what? Like, what people are using? I genuinely think Destiny only thinks genocide happens slowly over time. If, th if I Thanos snapped one entire race out of existence, they all instantly to D that is not genocide is worst take ever. He thinks you have to say, I am doing a genocide. Otherwise, it's not. Yeah, except Israel has said that. That's the other problem here. So it, it, enough Israeli officials have said that, which is the entire basis for why there was almost near unanimous support in the International Court of Justice. That clip was all over Twitter. Down Sorry. racial domination enacted through top down, like federal legislative policies or whatever, means that I don't know if... Um, I don't know if Jim Crow would have qualified have for apartheid. That doesn't make it any less. Versus excuse versus me, versus Twinkelstein. Have I'm talking right now. Excuse me, excuse me, Twinkelstein. I'm talking to your friend over here. Um, I don't know if it would have qualified as the crime of apartheid. Just like if Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of In genocide. In your eyes, top down apartheid. racial domination enacted through top down. I think he's saying that genocide requires special intent to commit it. Yeah, which by the way, Israel does have and has shown time and time again that they. They have that special intent. This unironic, his level of argumentation, his, his, his style of arguing here leads me to believe that the only thing that he doesn't agree with the Nazis on with respect to the Holocaust is that like, like, I guess he, he didn't believe the, the things that Nazis believed about Jewish people, about like racial superiority. But he does believe that about Israel uh, and its racial superior, racial and religious superiority over 
the Palestinian population. Like, straight up. Everything he has said thus far leads me to this conclusion. Like, if he also believed what the Nazis were saying about the Jews, he's like, yeah, of course. Like, I mean, there's just cause here, you know? They're making good arguments. They're presenting good uh, arguments to, to why they have to deal with the, with the Jewish question. I generally think he wouldn't think the Holocaust wasn't a genocide if it happened in five months instead of five years. Except, like, the final solution did happen in a very short period of time. I know that, like, the majority of deaths before then uh, happened throughout that entire process. But, like, there were, it was still greatly sped up. You know what I mean? It's like, but what if, like, Israel was doing, like, nuke maintenance and cleaning the console and shit, and then some dude accidentally pressed the button and the nuke coincidentally hits Gaza and kills 2 million Palestinians? Would that be a genocide? I think not. Yeah, like, <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> Probably not. I don't. Well, mm. yeah, but because genocide requires a special intent. I think the issue yeah. is. And, 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 and can you show the intent of Israel doing a genocide for hate watchers in the chat? Defense Minister Yoav Gallant saying we are fighting human animals and therefore we have to stop food, water, and all matter of aid going into Gaza October 8th. Benjamin Netanyahu saying this is Amalek and comparing um, a, a, a story within Judaism to. Um, to, to what happened where they were completely exterminated. Any quote from Ben Gvir, any quote from Smaltrich, the entire ICJ court case lays out in no matter of uncertainty, there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. Herzog saying there are no innocent civilians in Gaza. And it's not just people in positions of power saying it. There's a direct through line from people in positions of power saying it all the way down to the soldiers on the ground repeating those exact terms, including Amalek. Instead of, and I think this conversation is actually is emblematic of the entire conversation. I don't yeah, think anything- Let me finish I don't think, answering Well, Jenny sure, but you accused question. me of supporting racism. So yeah. Well, I, I you think did. The, the, and I you did are. It. I did it. Do you think I support Jim Crow laws? Look, when- The fact when, that you can't even answer that honestly, It doesn't right? matter you what- You say that 800 civilians you know were killed by, by Hamas. You said, well, maybe 400 were killed by Israel. No, I don't I know the number. That. Maybe- no, I didn't say that. He did not say that. He did not say that at all. You're just making shit up now. I like that he's upset about his own words being used against him in this conversation. And he's not even trying to, like, defend the position and immediately resorts back to making up shit that, like, his opponents are saying that they did not say at all. How are you going to be... How are you going to be this good? Why do people watch you? This chat is pointless. What the fuck? You will never see my comment. Why should I follow you? This isn't enjoyable. Like as someone who wanted to start following me, this is not where I want to be. Okay, then dumbass. Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah. You said 400. No, I didn't You co-signed the opinion. No, no I didn't. No, I didn't. Oh, well, wait, how many? What do you, I think the word was some. That's what I heard. No, I Well, you weren't were, listening. How many people do you think approximately, if you, had to ball, if you had to ballpark it, how many do you think were killed by Hamas I on October 7th? I think it's pretty clear that the majority of civilians that That's were killed. 51%? Or 90%. Don't ask me to put a number I just want on a ballpark. something Those are two I don't very know. Different First of all, are you when you say Hamas, do you mean Palestinians or do you mean Hamas I mean the specifically? invading Palestinian force. I don't well, like to say- That's crazy. Like, what, What's the percentage? Is it 51%? Is it 90%? Like he's saying the majority of the civilians unconditionally, unquestionably was killed by Palestinian resistance forces. Of course, he's not going to give you a number because he doesn't- no, that's not his fault. That's actually no one's fault at this point. The forensic architecture and and the analysis will take years. It will take years to fully parse through how many of the civilians that were murdered on October 7 were murdered in the hands of Israeli rocket fire, whether it be from helicopter gunships or whether it be from artillery from tanks in the kibbutzim, okay? This doesn't change anything ultimately because when you say that the majority of civilians were still unquestionably, undoubtedly killed by uh, the, the Palestinian forces, you, you're, you're recognizing the reality. What the it is simply trying to pick apart a semantic point to, to posture as though you have any kind of moral high ground in this conversation say Palestinians because I don't think all Palestinian civilians were involved. No. Attacks. I'll say Hamas, Islamic you Jihad, mean, whatever, al -Quds, but whatever that, that's how this discussion... Whenever D is out of his depth, he turns to these irrational arguments where he can try to get you on quick answers. Yeah. This is this is what I like to call the clip show. Um, he's playing to the audience that currently isn't live watching, right? He does this all the time 
and then he will simply say, well, I'm, I'm just testing your, your moral boundaries. I've never forgotten this last ditch effort that he applied on the, he should be able to say the N word in a vacuum argument that his fans still five, six years after the fact constantly fucking bring up. Well, they don't bring up how stupid his argument was, but they, they don't even bring the argument itself up, but simply state Hassan actually agreed with destiny's position on white people being able to say the N word. No one obviously believes them. Only the hug box believes that dumbassery. It's like, it, it, it's literally, oh, I'm just simply get, presenting you with some rapid fire questions to test out your moral boundaries. It's like, what if I were to say the N word in the vacuum of space by myself? Would that be okay? That was his major, that was his brilliant five head uh, argument to why he should be able to say it. Discussion started, you said Hamas, and I began to answer that. And then Benny Morris said, actually, he means Hamas in addition to Jihad and the others. So, so of the invading Palestinian force, how many do you think killed civilians versus the IDF? What do you think of the ballpark, the percentage? Well, the figures we have are that about a third of the casualties on October 7th were military. That's and not about what I asked at all. Were, what's your question? How many, what percentage of civilians how do you think were killed the by the invading force? I, I, think, I think a clear majority, but I can't you give you a specific yeah. figure. If you thought it was closer to 51% or 99% were would killed he, by... Why would how, he how, know that? How would he know because that? it's interesting no, to actually stake I, out a position. I, yeah, it's interesting. If you want to be... It's not. It's not. Because the overarching concession has been made because they are being truthful. They're honest. Kaya, no, they're being honest. Yeah, he's, he's, dude, listen, 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 listen. He, this is it. It's trying to intellectualize a gotcha moment that you're trying to create here. Okay. I'm trying to stake out. I'm trying to stake out your position. It's actually interesting to stake out your position. Why don't you, why won't you just say a random number? Why won't you say a number that is random so that I can uh, act like I have the moral high ground here? Completely irrelevant, by the way, five hours in, what does this argument do? They already said that it's the majority of civilians that were killed by Palestinian resistance. Completely, they, totally agnostic they, on they it, that's based fine. On complete ignorance because we don't know Professor Morris doesn't know. Louine Rabani doesn't know. And yet you can know. speak with absolute complete... certainty that the IDF is targeting and murdering Palestinian I... children. Yes, because there's infinitely more evidence to that matter, both in genocidal intent. Shouts out to the Israeli authorities for being so welcoming and so open about their genocidal ambitions. And there's infinitely more evidence to the deliberate targeting, both historically in the way that Israel has uh, applied the Dahiya Doctrine, but also in this round of the siege where they, uh, according to the 972 Magazine's investigation, have what they consider to be high-priority targets. It's not an accident that 25,000-plus women and children have been ruthlessly slaughtered by Israeli forces in this incursion, much, much higher number of civilian casualties in this incursion than any other prior siege. That's the problem. The problem is there is evidence for one. There's not enough evidence to make a clear-cut percentage number for the other there's evidence for genocidal intent and there's certainly evidence for indiscriminate discriminately bombing civilian targets that uh, is so so broad reaching the impact of it is so broad reaching that it comes across as indiscriminate children intentionally oh, actually, you see the double standard no i don't you see i know you don't i know it's a rhetorical I don't question see, obviously you, know you don't why? <laughs> Because, because you I, want looked at, the I looked at the UN report. Uh -huh. I looked at the, the Goldstone UN report. report. No, the UN report on the Great March of Return. I know his ass knows the Goldstone report because, like, again, Hasbara, okay? Like, literally, literally just hitting all the Hasbara talking about. It's like, anytime, if there's any gripe from a, a, a Zionist, like, they have told Destiny that this, is, this will be a good line. I know. He has that loaded in the chamber. If Norm was bringing up the Goldstone report, which, by the way, there is a shit ton more, okay, uh, UN reports than the Goldstone report, for the record. <laughs> but he only brought that one up specifically because he knows that one, because he knows what the counter to that is. He's going to immediately be like, well, Goldstone actually went back on his assessment, even though the other parties involved in the report did not. And Goldstone was harassed endlessly for it. Straight up right there. The reason why he immediately f***ed with the Goldstone report, which is from years prior, mind you, and irrelevant to at least this incursion. Goldstone didn't even refute the main points of the UN and the other authors stand by it. Exactly. But it doesn't matter. He, he, but that's a good gotcha to be like, ha ha, 
You brought up the Goldstone report. Well, did you know? I'll have you know that Gold, the same report that Goldstone himself said was like not good and not up to snuff. That is the reason why he brought that up. It, that's not what Norm is talking about at all. And the only reason why he would think Norm is talking about the Goldstone report, specifically in this incursion, in this instance, in this siege, is because in this siege is because he knows a good counter for it. He's trying to bait him into saying yes so that he can counter it and get a fucking clip off. In 2018, and they said that the snipers were targeting children, medics, journalists, and disabled people. Just as we they are now in this conflict. Exactly. No uh, more journalists have been killed in the last several months in Gaza than in any other do conflict. You and then in all of World War II. That in all of World War II. Hamas is not killing you, journalists does, in the Gaza Do you Strip. agree that they More, operate in civilian uniforms, that their goal is to induce that confusion? That that's the, the, the way that they conduct themselves? If he knew anything about international law, he'd know that a spontaneous militia is actually well within the bounds of, of uh, international law, for the record. He says civilian uniforms. You know who actually violated international law? Israel. When they wore doctor's uniforms to enter a f hospital in the West Bank. Why the f would he ever bring this up? That's so dumb. Hamas being in a defensive posture against uh, the, the occupying force is well within the grounds, well within their rights under international law to fight, not with like full-blown military gear, but with uh, civilian garb. Militarily, let me finish my point. More journalists I have, have been I, more you are children. I, I, in the... He doesn't want to hear it. So, no, because it's virtue, it's so you're not boring. having a, a material, a substantial, it is virtue, virtue signaling. signaling. Yeah, yes, like when you say children, you can see when he's just saying random and wrong stuff when Benny is quiet and not defending him. Yeah, and over but, and over again, that's virtue talking signaling. about you know, you talking have, about you have how many, this, you have talking about how many Israelis were dead. killed. That's not virtue signaling because that's human life. I don't care about, I don't care if you just killed her a thousand, you just didn't care. Blame to. 51%, 90%, the question, then, yes, and then that, Mouin, that's not the number, then, that's the responsibility and Mouin, norm. And then Moeen mentions that more journalists were killed in Gaza than in all of World War II. That doesn't get it, that doesn't further any and part of the conversation. And more medics were killed No, no, that's, in Gaza. So that's silly. And, and then journalists, he says it's virtual <laughs> in the area. But when Israelis get killed, that's serious. I never well, said it's serious yeah. on both well, sides. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't say you were <laughs> He's like, I don't give a fuck about how many Israelis killed. I love death and murder. <laughs> He's like, no, you don't understand. I don't care. <laughs> He's just like, he doesn't care how many people die. What the fuck? It is wild that it, 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 so in certain circles, like being a, a, a relentless sociopath, like a bloodless monster, is seen as like peak virtue. Not realizing that this isn't happening. This debate is not happening in a vacuum. It's not happening in his own fucking hug box. This debate is literally happening in front of millions of people. One million so far in one day. What is this? I would have shot her twice while simultaneously kneeling on George Floyd's neck for 19 minutes. What the fuck? Dude, locking this fucking asshole was the greatest decision of my life, honestly. And it's been years. So much happier that I don't know all the unhinged shit that he tweets about. I'm, virtue virtue signaling. Signaling. No, 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 no. I'm not virtue, virtue signaling. signaling. I'm asking a substantive question of who do you assign blame to? Or do you play into Norm Finkelstein's conspiracies? I think, I that the ambulances should have known immediately who was dead, that the numbers were changed because uh, they were Mr. fake, Burrell, or that Mr. maybe 51% of the Mr. people Burrell, were killed look, by uh, by Hamas and, and Islamic Jihad, but 49% were killed by IDF helicopters. Me, you asked me a direct question, <laughs> and you got a direct answer. I didn't. I got majority, which could be anywhere I said from a 51 clear, to I 99. Said a clear majority. What percent is a clear majority? As opposed it's always, to they live in ambiguity. A clear majority, in my view, is well over 50%. Please don't ask me to be more precise. You because could, I, you, know, you could say 80, 90, 95. You know, I don't, if I knew that, this I would... This is such a dumb... Dude, <laughs> this is such a fucking dumb conversation. I'm sorry. We don't know. Not that it matters, because it is the majority. A clear majority. What the fuck? Like, it is irrelevant. You've already said that it is an atrocity. What the fuck? What are we doing here?
like they this is they're desperately trying to win points on this side of the table on the other side of the table they're like look i don't know what the actual numbers are and and we won't know for some time but it's definitely a clear majority like one side is trying to state factually accurate analysis the other side is like come on come on come on but tell me tell me what your suspicion is say it i think it's reasonable it's a reasonable perhaps it is but i you're not the best person to be asking that question you know i read when you wrote up described operation defensive shield and you said a few dozen homes were destroyed. You're talking about what happened in the Jenin yeah, refugee right. camp. And you said... No, the you Arabs said, said 500. You, you said guys said 500 you said Palestinians few, were killed in no, Jenin. No, no. I never said and that. Then no, the, no. no but that. that was the statement uh, of the PLO, the, the Palestinian you, Authority. You said a few dozen homes And that there were massacres there. There were a few dozen yes, homes Yes, a few ago. dozen homes. <laughs> you guys, you're Arab. <laughs> you're people. <laughs> Come on. Boom. Yeah, well, it That's turned right. out uh, 140 building, buildings were destroyed. 5,000 5, people, 5, people were left homeless. How many you were just, killed? 5,000. How many You described killed? it. No, I'm talking about homes destroyed. So you're not the best person to be criticizing what Muin says when he says clear majority, but he can't say more. You know why he can't say more? He doesn't know. I, he doesn't know. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I, I hold that as a historical. If, if, I, if I was trying that, to belittle, I would give you a very different answer. I would just say, I don't know. The, I do the, know the right that some phrase, were shot. You know what the right phrase there would be? The overwhelming majority were killed by Arab gunmen. And very small number were killed by Israelis by accident or whatever. You're not That's probably as a historian, true. Though. That's probably that, true. That, that maybe the, that. I, I, can, I can state with confidence a clear majority overwhelming majority you may be correct but i can't state that with certainty i think there's a very easy way to find out is to have a independent forget independent I know exactly. you know well of course you forget, forget independent the law. forget that doesn't mean forget anything. the law forget independence forget, forget international law forget independent assessments no just take my word for it big dog what do you mean <laughs> what the fuck come on benny the fuck are you doing how are people going to take you seriously as a fucking academic if this is how you play fast and loose with like matters of historical record, like what? <laughs> He's like, listen, when it comes to scrutiny, I apply the utmost scrutiny to matters of historic record. When history is happening in front of me, however, I'm going to be like, eh, who cares? <laughs> who cares? Fuck it. YOLO. He's saying, you know what it is? He's like, as a historian, as a historian, it makes my job all the more sweet. After all, I am a new historian. If it wasn't for the early Zionists that uh, muddied the waters about the actions of the Nakba, I would have never been, become a, an important figure in Israeli history. So win-win for me. I like when they muddied the waters so that I can do my job I can do my job 10, 20 years, 30 years after the fact and, and keep actually investigating and uncovering truths. It's great. <laughs> he's, just, he, he's just basically thinking three steps ahead. You and I forget independent for human rights. No, not necessarily. Just repeat the numbers. All, all just from repeat barbaric the barbaric countries. You know, you know, a Syrian was the head of the UN Commission for Human Rights. But if it wasn't Libyan, Israeli, it would have been okay. Whoa, whoa. Yo. Brother, that's crazy. A Syrian was the head of the UN Commission for Human Rights, he said. Yo, this got way more unhinged. I feel like Lex was like, all right, we got to cut this down. We got to stop this shit. Bro, bro, he got, I feel like <laughs> Destiny's uh, relentless, uh, unrestricted racism rubbed off on Benny a little bit. So much so that I wouldn't say that he wasn't, you know, it's not like Benny wasn't racist before, wasn't not racist or was anti-racist. Like he wasn't, right? But <laughs> but I think Destiny gave him the, the confidence to, to speak his truth. <laughs> He's like, I love, yeah. I love that this segment is called Hope for the Future. 
you know, a Syrian was the head of the yeah. UN Commission for Human Rights. But if it wasn't Olympian, Israeli, it would have been okay. He certainly would have been more honest yeah. than a Syrian. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Bro! Wait, why is he not embarrassed to say that? Bro! Dude, what the fuck? Yo, look at look at Rabani's face when he says that. <laughs> Losing my mind. What the fuck? Yo, I swear to God, Israelis have zero chill. They think everyone agrees with them. <laughs> Brother, in most of the other parts of the world, people at least like try to act like they are not this racist, okay? <laughs> Bro, you are not... You are not on the alt account, Benny. Benny, this is your main. Benny, stop tweeting. Assyrian. <laughs> Notorious liars. <laughs> what the fuck? For, from your perspective. Well, to disagree with Steven, I thought this was extremely valuable. Uh, and at times, really, like the, the, the view of history, the, the passion. Um... I'm really grateful that uh, you would spend your really valuable time. And just one more question, since we have uh, two historians here. Well, just briefly, uh, from a history perspective, what do you hope your legacy as historians, Benny and Norm, will be of the work? I think Benny's legacy, <laughs> Benny, it's such a funny question to ask this to Benny. Because on the one hand, you have a guy who is, they're both very controversial in different ways. You have, a, you have one guy, Norm, very controversial, but very consistent, very principled. On the other hand, across the fucking table, sitting across from him, the guy who just said, a Syrian is dishonest. It is in their nature, okay? <laughs> the other guy who said that literally has spent most of his career shitting on his work, <laughs> And those who use his work, his legacy is forever going to be trying to fight against every other subsequent historian that came after him that utilized his words in the same exact way that Norm did in this fucking debate. Okay? Straight up. That's all he does. Hours upon hours and hours of words typed out specifically to be like you guys are actually misunderstanding like i was saying it's good that there was planned uh, ethnic displacement please stop saying that there was planned ethnic displacement and it was bad say that there was planned ethnic displacement and it was good it was for a higher cause it was for a greater good you guys misunderstood me please stop doing this now of course plenty of historians might have this take now the problem is he was one of the first so he is now in the halls of history, specifically Israeli history, alongside the likes of Ilan Pape and Avi Shleim as a new historian, because he was one of the first to get there. That's the funniest part about it. The funniest part about it is that... The funniest part about it is that his legacy has actually moved people in the right direction, Okay, can we finish the last three minutes in case there's more memes? Yeah. That you've put out there. Maybe Norm, you can go first and try to just say briefly. I think there's a, a value to pr preserving the record. I'm not optimistic about where things are going to end up. There was a very nice book written by a woman named Helen Hunt Jackson. Yeah. I never thought, I, I never thought Destiny would somehow get cucked harder than that fucking clip that's like floating around Twitter that I saw where like he's just sitting there like a little weasel in his fucking cuck chair as his now former wife is dancing with that dude uh what is it abba and preach like i really didn't think that he would be in the cuck chair again and here he is prominently in a worse position this time intellectually cucked just watching three dudes have a conversation as he has to sit there and just like take pot shots and, you know, talk about nuking Gaza. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, describing what was done to the Native Americans, she called it a century of dishonor. And she described in vivid, uh, 
poignant detail what was done to the Native Americans. Did it save them? No. Did it help them? Probably not. Did it preserve their memory? Yes. And I think there's a value to that. You know, there was a famous film by Eisenstein, Sergei Eisenstein. It was either Battleship Potemkin or Mother. I can't remember which one. The last scene was the Tsar's troops mowing down all the Russian people. He pans the scene. Not all the Russian people, just a few. Yeah. Well, he pans the massacre. He pans the massacre. But he could and have the, killed a lot more. <laughs> and the last words of the movie were... <laughs> good one. Dude, good one, dude. Fucking hey, He said he could have killed a lot more. Proletarians, exclamation point, remember, exclamation point. And I've seen it as my life's work to preserve the memory and to remember. I didn't expect that anyone would read my book on Gaza. It's very dense. It gives me even a, a bit of a headache to read at least one of the chapters. You wrote a book uh, on Gaza. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I thought that the memory deserves to be preserved. Amen. Well, I would, dude, I, okay, suspicion here. I'm willing to bet if they were to talk about the USSR, I feel like Benny would agree 100 P with big boy over here. And, and <laughs> destiny would be extra cucked. I like a lot of people don't know this maybe, but, um, <laughs> a lot of people went from the USSR to Israel a lot of Russians still immigrate into uh, into Israel. There's a lot of uh, pushing Z going on in Israel as well. Just say um, very briefly, unlike my colleague, I think writing the truth about what happened in history in various periods of history, if I've done a little bit of that, I'm happy. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Benny. Thank you, Steven. Thank you, Moeen. Thanks for listening. There was a Reddit post there this morning that they needed to post more tweets to change the narrative. They're trying to do Hasbro, but for Destiny, a man who notoriously fucks himself over every time he tweets in an unrestricted fashion.